Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Good day and uh, with respect to your time zones. Welcome to the IBRO APRC Associate School of Neuroscience, Karachi, Pakistan, entitled as Untangling the Degenerating Brains from Neurobiology to Psychopathology. Let me tell Sorry for the inconvenience. Welcome you all in IBRO APRC Associate School of Neuroscience and Tangling the Degenerating Brains from Neurobiology to Psychopathology. Let me introduce you to the school that is a six day school comprised of talks, activities, and lab tutorials. Uh, we are very much uh, uh, hopeful that this school will focus together all the experts in the diverse field of neurosciences working on solving the mysteries of degenerative brains and also to discuss this public health burden of neurodegenerative diseases like uh, developing countries and underdeveloped countries with recent advances of human and animal research. I hope that this will help uh, the, to integrate the participants with a growing opportunity for revising the pre-existing methodologies to enhance the critical thinking about the new techniques and to establish them locally at their place. As you all know that we are uh, facing this pandemic and uh, there is a lot of constraint uh, related to the restrictions on physical events and traveling. So we have been uh, very in, uh, encouraged to organize this school physically, but uh, due to such uh, circumstances, this event is going to be virtual. We have speakers from different cities of USA, Malaysia, Canada, Pakistan. Moreover, we have potential list of participants from Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Cyprus, Africa, China, Pakistan, and others. A list of participants will be uh, joining us through the live uh, channel and few of uh, the selected participants selected by IVRO last year, they will be joining us in the Zoom uh, session directly as well. We are very hopeful that organizing such global networking events will help reducing the burden of chronic disease and make us work together as a scientific community towards overall well-being of the people. I'm very glad and thankful for International Brain Research Organization for giving us always the opportunity to connect Pakistan globally and uh, uh, will be able that we will be able to not only share our part of the research, but also to learn from different mentors and different scientists from all over the world. We are very grateful for the uh, support uh, from University of Karachi as an encouraging platform to just not only organize such events, but also to propagate and advocate the neuroscience uh, research all over uh, the part of the uh, Pakistan. Uh, collaborators of this, or, uh, this uh, event is Pakistan Society of Basic and Applied Neurosciences, uh, which is one of the uh, official organization that is uh, actually hosting the events and also supporting the neuroscientists in Pakistan. Along with that, other collaborators are the Science Bridge, Advanced Educational Institute and Research Center, Center for Health and Wellbeing of University of Karachi, Psychophysiology Research Lab, and Neurofeedback Clinics. We are very hopeful that. This event will help you and uh, just uh, let you uh, learn something. Now let me introduce you about one of the uh, main supporter of this event, uh, Professor Dr. Pixie. She is uh, the chair of IBRO APRC. She is also the associate professor from University of Putra, Malaysia, a very dynamic neuroscientist, uh, has been uh, working in the propagation and advocacy of neuroscience uh, since 2000s. 
and uh, she is uh, uh, actually here uh, with her video message. Due to this six day Ebro APRC Associate School of New Day. Hi, hi. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this six-day Ebro APRC Associate School of Neuroscience 2021 in Pakistan. The theme of the school focuses to untangle the degenerating brains from neurobiology to psychopathology, with the aims to educate young scientists, to convey a sense of excitement and hope in the neurodegenerative disease research field and to acknowledge the challenges ahead. This school serves as an ideal platform to create quality interactions between aspiring students with the experts in the area. I wish to express my sincere appreciation to the collaborative effort from local and international speakers for your commitment and dedication in this knowledge sharing activity. I hope that this event will pave ways to harness support among the key policy makers, authoritative leaders, and philanthropists to increase research and public education resources concerning neurodegeneration. To the organizing committee, led by Assist Assistant Professor Dr. Sada, congratulations for your success in hosting this event in Pakistan. I wish you and your team a great success. To participants and awardees of the school, I hope you to have a good learning experience, gain new ideas and inspiration to explore this exciting research field of neuroscience. Ladies and gentlemen, the Associate Neuroscience School U this uh, 2021 is funded by Ebro APRC grant as one of our commitment to promote neuroscience in Asia Pacific region. I would like to take this opportunity to share with you vision of Ebro and a couple of funding supports available for the fellow scientists, societies, and institutions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, and our fellow friends from the neuroscience community, greetings. Are you looking for breaking neuroscience news in the Asia Pacific region? Or you want to find out about the grant opportunities? Or you're passionate and eager to link up with other researchers to build the Asia Pacific neuroscience community? To address any of this, Ebro would be the ideal scientific platform that you must not miss. The International Brain Research Organization is established in year 1961. We aim to promote and support neuroscience around the world through training, education, research, outreach, and engagement activities. Here, I would like to share the core values of Ebro. Ebro serves the global neuroscience community and we are guided by a set of core organization's values. As the world and its needs change, we acknowledge that these values remain constant. Ebro community is diverse. Ebro strives to integrate different opinions, backgrounds, expertise through a healthy debate and discussion. Ebro also strives to ensure equitable access, participation, and leadership in neuroscience. We continue to create opportunities for those who have no or limited access to resources, education, training, mentorship, and financial support. Neuroscience has no borders. Ebro emphasizes inclusiveness, that we believe in the scientific community everyone has the right to assess, participate, and benefit from global resources. 
the Executive Committee of EBRO. Our current EBRO president is Tracy Bell from United States, Sunjing Jung from South Korea as our Secretary General, and Jerome Singh from United States as the Treasurer. Under the umbrella of EBRO, the Asia Pacific Regional Committee, APRC, is formed with the aim to bring neuroscience to the world. We are a team of eight with elected representatives from six countries. The members include myself, Pak Sicha from Malaysia, Bronwyn from New Zealand, Yukiko and Tadashi from Japan, Arnab from India, Batushin from Mongolia, and Yun Wang and Wing Ho Yong from China. APRC is devoted to focus on supporting and promoting neuroscience in the Asia Pacific region based on its specific needs and conditions. You are invited to visit our website to get to know more about our ongoing activities. You may also check out our main Facebook page of EBRO and APRC Facebook pages for the latest news and activities updates. We look forward to connecting with you. Don't forget to follow us on other social media as well, Twitter and LinkedIn. EBRO and APRC provides a broad range of funding opportunities to support neuroscience around the world to benefit the neuroscience community in three main categories individual scientists, organizers, and partnerships. We offer various grants to support individual scientists for collaborative research with another lab globally, grants for early PIs, travel grants to attend SFN in the United States and other scientific events globally, short stay grants, and funding to support scientists with career interruption due to pregnancy, maternity leave, and child primary caregiving. There's also fellowships for individual scientists, including the EBRO and the International Bureau of Education of the UNESCO Science of Learning Fellowships, Return Home Fellowships, and Exchange Fellowships. I would like to welcome you to submit your scientific manuscripts at the EBRO's flagship journal, Neuroscience. With this journal indexed in nine international databases, your published article can be read and cited by researchers worldwide. Another official journal of EBRO is EBRO Neuroscience Reports. The journal is previously known as EBRO Reports. It is currently indexed in four international databases. EBRO and the Spanish Neuroscience Society are excited to announce that the 11th EBRO World Congress of Neuroscience in 2023. Stay tuned and registered to attend this exciting meeting and apply for the travel support. We hope to meet you there. Finally, we welcome the global neuroscience community to join us at EBRO and EBRO APRC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pixie. Let me now welcome the dynamic and honorable Vice Chancellor of University of Karachi. It is my honor to introduce Professor Dr. Khalid Iraqi, Vice Chancellor of University of Karachi. Dr. Iraqi is a well known social scientist with his specialization in public policy, development studies, and public relations. Besides teaching at University of Karachi, Professor Dr. Iraqi was also the part of visiting faculty at various renowned universities across Pakistan. He has also served as Dean Faculty of Management, Administrative Sciences, Chairman, Department of Public Administration, Director Admissions, University of Karachi, Advisor to Vice Chancellor, and many more positions. He is one of the most dynamic and supporting Vice Chancellor we have, and we are very much honored that he is here to encourage us. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Thank you. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Rishi. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Greetings from Pakistan to all the global and national participants, experts, and organizers. 
Uh, it is indeed an important event for the University of Karachi for organizing this event in collaboration with IBRO. Let me have a very brief introduction about the University of Karachi. It established way back in 1947. We have 54 departments and 23 research institutes. Uh, we believe that the University of Karachi is a progressive university. It is a university of relevance and we believe in academic excellence. Academic excellence is not possible without utmost dedication, hard work and perseverance. Living in Pakistan and running an academic institution, we believe that the pathway to progress and development is about research, develop, development and scientific collaboration. We live in a world where we have to share our strength with each other. I am a particularly a strong advocate of research collaboration. And I think this even is an example that how Karachi University is looking forward to have a collaboration with international community. I was very much impressed by the profile of different speakers and the resource person who are going to be part of this six day event, uh, making a deliberate and scientific investigation about different issues which we are facing as a community. Uh, we need to discuss different issues in different societal contexts. I think the resource person with a different background, they will provide the input to our scholars and those people who are interested in such a topic. This school is a very important uh, contribution at the University of Karachi. And I must congratulate Dr. Sadaf Ahmed for playing a very pivotal and important role in making this school a functional school. Functional in the sense that in a continuous process, they are engaged in research, development, and collaboration. I wish the IBRO and APRC school organizing team and scientific committee all the very best and expect a very thorough bad, brainstorm on various thrusts of the conference. Uh, because of the COVID, it was not possible to invite people to physically visit Pakistan and campus. But I think with the progress we are making in dealing with the COVID, next time we expect all the participants to be physically present in Pakistan and see the campus and have a dialogue with each other. I firmly believe that the multidisciplinary approach being adopted by this conference will provide a new avenue of exploring uh, investigation and shaping our future in the right direction. I like to appreciate the effort of international brain research organizer, organization for making this happen and helping the developing countries to bring out the best of their faculty as well as investigating their energies and resource to train research scholar on such grand level. 
your support is definitely making a mark on the brains that will go a long way. I wish a very good success to this event and hope to see a much more collaboration in future. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, sir, for your encouragement and the words. Thank you so much. Now we have with us uh, the Deputy Director of Advanced Educational Institute and Research Center, Dr. Sayyid Aziz with us. Uh, Professor Dr. Sayyid Abdul Aziz is uh, uh, alumni of University of Karachi. He did his PhD in genetics from University of Karachi. After that, he joined University of Ottawa, Canada as the professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. He is uh, currently serving as professor at University of Ottawa and also as a scientist, senior scientist as Health Canada for the toxicology research division. He is one of the uh, most dynamic uh, researcher and uh, uh, person who encouraged not only the research, his area of research is most oncology, angiogenesis, apoptosis, stem cell, and toxicology. Besides this, Dr. Aziz is also a member of uh, various scientific societies, including Society of Toxicology Canada. He is also associated with Research Council of Canada, for the awards of grants, and he's associated with journals like Human Molecular Genetics, BMJ Open, International Journal of Molecular Medicine, PLOS One, and International Journal of Endorsing Health Science Research. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us, and we would like to have your words for this conference. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I must say uh, good morning from Canada because it is uh, almost 1 a.m. over here in Canada. I welcome you all to this uh, uh, international conference organized by Advanced Educational Re Institute and Research Center in collaboration with International Brain uh, Research Organization and Asia, uh, Asia Pacific Regional Committee. As you all know, this is a six day very comprehensive a workshop which is comprises of lectures from the experts in their field and also uh, activities and lab tutorials. And in my uh, humble opinion, this is a, a pretty much uh, in timely uh, workshop which is organized by uh, Eric in collaboration with uh, IBRO and APRRC uh, because with the COVID and lockdown, uh, most of us uh, must have gone a little crazy uh, due to this uh, unprecedented uh, time. So we need some uh, some kind of uh, uh, you know workshop uh, to understand the psychopathology and psychology which has um, emerged uh, uh, in, in the last uh, couple of years, especially due to lockdown and COVID. So I welcome you all and wish you all the best. And I hope that this will uh, be a very exciting uh, six days for all of the par participants and also for the experts uh, to share their experience and we may uh, be able to uh, exchange some of the uh, our perspectives and opinion with the experts and try to learn uh, some of the things which is uh, quite pressing uh, at the moment. Thank you so much and I, I, I welcome you all again. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, uh, we would like to uh, thank you all for joining. And we will be taking our speaker uh, in 15 minutes uh, as the program is scheduled. Professor Dr. Athar Inam will be joining us uh, for the first plenary talk. And then Professor Dr. Naveed Sayyad from University of Calgary, he will be joining for the today's talk. So thank you so much uh, all for joining the inaugural session. And uh, after 15 minutes, we will be commencing with our you know, the keynote session. Thank you.
it on the other. Hello everyone, welcome back. Let me introduce the uh, heart and brain of Pakistan Neuroscience. Uh, the founding president of Pakistan Society of Basic and Applied Neuroscience, Professor Dr. Akhar Inam. Dr. Inam is a US-based certified neurosurgeon and professor of neurosurgery and chair department of surgery at Aga Khan University, Karachi, Pakistan. He has been awarded several accolades and honors for his work in USA and Pakistan, including the Physician of the Year Medallion, Master Surgeon Award, Excellence of Neurosurgery Award, and the Presidential Award, Sitara Impias. Dr. Inam has a very strong interest in basic science research with a PhD in neuroscience from Northwestern University, USA. He is a life member of Sigma 11 and uh, a scientific research honor society, as well as the founding president of Pakistan Society of Basic and Applied Neuroscience. He is one of the dynamic uh, person who always encourages the young potential in Pakistan, also advocate for the neuroscience and a very much like a father figure for all the neuroscientists uh, in the Pakistan. 
a member of executive committee of American Association of Neurosurgeons, uh, CNS section of Brain Tumors USA and member of advisory board of the Science Bridge. He has been editor of several international journals. He's a very much uh, enthusiastic and very much motivating um, speaker who delivered numerous lectures globally on neurosurgery, neuro-oncology and neuroscience topic. He's currently supervising the PhD for Higher Education Commission of Pakistan. He's actively involved in many clinical and basic science researches and the projects and has authored more than 100 PubMed index manuscripts and articles. His primary focus is the promotion of neuroscience and neuro-oncology in Pakistan that is much evident in his work and uh, promoting neuroscience globally as well, as well as to represent Pakistan globally. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us and uh, agreeing to give this uh, plenary talk. Thank you so much. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Sadaf. Uh, good morning, Assalamu alaikum. And you know, if there are people in other part of the world, a good evening and good day. Uh, thank you for the introduction. That was a uh, little too flattering. Uh, so, um, you know, I should have turned my uh, switched off my video. Uh, but I wanted to uh, actually say what you have done for neuroscience in Pakistan. And I understand that uh, what we see over here is about twenty-five people or so, right? But then there's more in, uh, in live streaming. That's what I understand, right? Okay. So, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, since we, since I started little early, so I have the luxury of saying little more. Uh, so, Dr. Sadaf, I came to know Dr. Sadaf in two thousand seven, when we were doing the first IBRO Associate School of Neuroscience. Uh, the University of Karachi was involved. I was at AKU, <clears throat> and uh, the person who really. Um, uh, 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 played the role of bringing us together was uh, Professor Khalid Iqbal, who will be uh, speaking, I think, tomorrow. And uh, and I remember Dr. Sadaf from then. Uh, it was a it was a pleasure to work with her, and it's just amazing that how focused and how uh, sincere she has been in her in her uh, um, passion for neuroscience. Um, she has been working for neuroscience since then and spreading the good things in this part of the world, despite all the negatives that one has to face either from here or from outside. So Sadaf, hats off to you, salute to you uh, for doing whatever you have done uh, in the last uh, so many years and uh, uh, also for this IBRO school. <clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, I will, uh, uh, well, you have to, it's, it says disabled participant screen sharing. So you will have to enable that please. And uh, while you do that, so uh, actually I'm at the, at the hospital. I had surgery scheduled today and, you know, my patients, I can't, uh, they are they're booked for uh, weeks so and months. So you can share the screen now. Okay. You can share the Booked for a screen uh, months and weeks in advance. So, uh, so I'm at the hospital. So now and then you may get disturbed because the overhead uh, will announce that such and such doctor or such and such uh, service is required in the OR. So, uska bura mat manna aap log, ignore kar dena us baat ko. Okay, so I have it here. No waiting minutes. I need to go to. There's another way to do it actually. Okay, so I do this and I go to advanced. Okay, and there you go. Okay, so <clears throat> so uh, uh, you can see my full screen, right? Uh, not not the black portions and all that thing okay all right so so uh well thank you very much uh ib arrow and the uh and thank you very much uh, uh sadaf um uh, for uh, inviting me to this uh, talk uh, this is just going to be very basic <clears throat> and uh, it will uh hopefully it will serve uh, to build the platform that for the next six days that uh, the attendees will be uh, listening to in this uh, in this uh, uh, six day period, um, um, I think we have some of the best scientists speaking. So I feel very humbled. Uh, you know, surgeons typically hamed uh, khali kartna aate aur taake lagane aate. So I feel very humbled uh, talking about uh, this topic. Uh, but uh, since 
my phd was on uh, cell biology of alzheimer's disease so it gives me slight confidence that yes maybe i can speak a little bit about these things uh and not just uh, do the uh, cutting and stitching uh, like a typical surgeon okay so uh, i think uh, dr sadaf has already introduced uh, these uh, um uh, uh, aarc ipro and science pitch and pass band so i don't need to do that uh, and uh, what i need to do however is uh, is turn my laser pointer on and and uh, right okay so disclosure statement no financial interest dr sadaf is not giving me a single penny for this thing and there's no company that's giving me any money for this all right so that's uh, a disclosure that's important okay so <clears throat> if you look at the uh, the cns diseases it's it's a huge uh, you know um uh, list from uh, simple molecular problems to cellular problems to uh, trauma and brain tumors and all that thing. So that list is, is, is a very, very long list. So what constitutes the neurodegenerative diseases? Uh, so if you look at this list, which is the, it says disease of the nervous system primary diseases. So it does not include, for example, brain tumors. It does not include hemorrhages that, that happen in, in the brain, uh, trauma to the brain, um, those kind of things, uh, gunshot to the brain. So, I mean, those things are also in a way diseases. Uh, so, uh, in this disease, um, uh, uh, Sadaf, can I ask you a quick question, please? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, yes, sir. so is my screen projecting okay? Because the, uh, um, yes, sir, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Okay. Because I, I can turn my video off. But no, I'd like sir, to keep the video on because my hands are Sir, actually, you are live, so we are interested in just showing your video. It is just on okay. the speaker view, so it is okay. you so and the screen. I move my hand and and you know. Yes, sure my thing. hair and all that thing. Okay, all right, I'll do that. Yes, sir. All right, all right thank sure you. Sure thing. <clears throat> you. So, 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 um, so, so the list is very long, but then, uh, and here is just a very small uh, list that that is typically talking about neurological. So you can you can put it. You can put it like this, uh, there is a uh, developmental uh, uh, nervous system diseases, right? Uh, there are uh, neurosurgical nervous system diseases and neurological nervous system diseases. And that's, that, that is the uh, three major category. Uh, in the developmental, uh, you know, a whole list of things comes in and some, neuro, some neurodegenerative diseases overlap in that area also. And then uh, in the neurosurgical, as I mentioned to you, brain tumors and trauma and, and whatnot, and hemorrhages and all that thing, aneurysms, uh, arteriovenous malformations, that's a separate category. This category, which is neurological diseases, this is also pretty long. But then still, uh, we can start to make some sense out of this. And in that, the degenerative diseases is again a big list over here. So if you look over here, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, there, are, there are degenerative diseases which are involved with extrapyramidal systems and dementia and things like that and this is all related to brain brain and then there are uh, some uh, degenerative diseases which are actually involving involving uh, uh, spinal cord and things like that <clears throat> so so there are other diseases encephalitis you know and uh, polymyelitis and those kind of things i'm not including those so this is a whole big list of diseases in fact there is a journal of uh, a journal of degenerative disorders uh, and, and if you if you look at uh, the, uh, the, the the JPND, uh, it focuses on all these diseases. So the most well known, the most common, the most studied, uh, the most uh, the, the, the disease that has the most scientists across the world uh, looking at is the Alzheimer's disease. And then comes the Parkinson's disease. Then there's a prion disease. We'll talk about that. And then there are a lot of other motor neuron disease and Huntington's disease and spinocerebellar ataxia and, and, and all those different. So, of course, obviously, I will not be able to cover all that. Impossible. What I need to do is to focus on some of the major diseases and then come up with the, the, uh, uh, the recurrent motif that helps us understand. One of the, most, one of the uh, key recurrent motif that comes, which you will notice, is a lot of them are genetic. Number two that comes up, a lot of them are because of some fragment starts to accumulate. Something starts to accumulate that causes the neurons to dysfunction or, or the synapses to degenerate or the neurons to die or, you know, uh, and, and all those things. 
So one is genetic and one is that the particles of certain chemicals starts, start to accumulate. Okay, so with that uh, preamble, let's, let's move on to the um, Alzheimer's uh, disease. So Alois Alzheimer, um, he um, uh, was, uh, sorry, let me turn this off. Okay, all right. So <clears throat> Alois Alzheimer, uh, he was a, a neuropathologist and a psychiatrist <clears throat> who described uh, Alzheimer's disease in 1906. Uh, he was looking at a woman uh, aged 51 years um, and then she went to asylum and then he just followed her uh, clinically and then when she died then he was able to uh, uh, look at it, her brain and then found certain key things neuropathological things and named it a certain disease and, and called it uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now in those days, this is 1906, and I think uh, the audience that we have over here, uh, their probably grandparents were born in that in that era. Uh, so, or or maybe grandparents, grandparents probably. Um, so so at that time, and then and then for subsequent uh, so many years, it was always thought that uh, the dementia that most of us get eventually over time we would think that that's the part of aging and that's why in the in the in, in urdu language the term is buddha satya in a satko so that was the term and it turned out that uh, when Alois alzheimer's came up with this uh, disease uh, alzheimer's disease it was called pre-senile dementia and that was thought to be as, as a as a as a entity itself and then of course there was dementia that people would go through when they were 60 or 70 or 80. It was only in the um, in the later part of the last century uh, that the um, that the uh, it was realized that actually uh, Alzheimer's disease is not only senile dementia. The those patients that get uh, demented in their uh, late age, they are also they also have Alzheimer's disease. So the whole the whole definition then shifted over, and that's when you know I, I actually joined my PhD lab in 1987. Uh, uh, and at that time, Alzheimer's disease was uh, switching this this whole concept. Uh, so there are some of the very well known figures have have had Alzheimer's disease. Uh, most of you guys won't know about them, but then there's Charlton Heston, Ben Hur just movie the Ronald Reagan, uh, you know uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, main politician political figures. So what happens in Alzheimer's disease is uh, is uh, <clears throat> there's an atrophy of the brain overall. So this is a normal brain. This is a, a brain with Alzheimer's disease. In an MRI, you can see that the ventricles and the white matter and the gray matter and all that thing has a normal look over here. And then in Alzheimer's, and uh, as we as we age, there is some atrophy of the brain anyway. But then over here, we start to see uh, more atrophy uh, over time, and that's that's the uh, that's the Alzheimer's disease uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, it starts with the um, what we call as temporal lobe, medial temporal lobe, hippocampus, and all that is involved. And hippocampus is connected to a lot of association cortices. So that's why the, the first thing that 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 occurs in Alzheimer's is, is memory loss because hippocampus is involved in the uh, declarative or or explicit um, memory. Uh, and then and then it, the the disease, the degeneration spreads out uh, throughout the brain, and it goes to the association cortices. The, the prefrontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, these are the association cortices that store a lot of information over there. And, and the functioning of these is important for your cognition, this is important for your executive functions, planning, thinking ahead and those kind of things. So when the disease spreads that part of the brain, all those things start to go down. Uh, so, the, so initially the Alzheimer's patients have memory problem, then they get into problem of uh, uh, executive functions, and then eventually the cognition goes down and eventually uh, my, my, my pupa, uh, otherwise he was fit, would walk around. But if you show him uh, a simple thing like a, like a rupee note, uh, he, would, he would not re recognize what it was. So, so, so the cogni cogni cognition of uh, his cognition was totally gone. So, <clears throat> so Alzheimer's disease, uh, the, the, the pathognomonic features that uh, Alois Alzheimer found were two. One is called amyloid plaque or senile plaque. Another one is called nephrotic tangles. This amyloid plaque is uh, present extracellularly. It's not within the cells, it's in between the neurons. And it just accumulates and grows bigger. 
and it takes particular strain and it it it, it has a uh, um, uh, um, beta amyloid in there, uh, it is an accumulation of that abnormal protein, only small molecule, it's not a big protein, it's small, 30, 35, 38 to 42 uh, amino acids. Now, this is very interesting structure, neurofibrillary tangles. They usually occur within the, within the neuron and they are made up of a certain protein that's involved in the uh, binding of uh, neural microtubules and I will show in the next slide. And they are very tough structures and um, the cells may die eventually, but these NFTs or neurofibrillary tangles, they may persist in there to the extent that you can take an Alzheimer's brain, which is, uh, you know, is full of all these plaques and, and tangles and let it degenerate. And then eventually you, if you, whatever is residue that's left over there, you collect that as all neurofibrillary tangles. They are so hard stuff. They don't, they don't get uh, destroyed by uh, different proteases and things like that. So, but then the interesting thing is neither senile plaques nor NFT are unique to Alzheimer's disease. You will find these kind of things in other, other as well. So that's why the whole discussion, what, what caused Alzheimer's disease? Is it the senile plaque? Is it the needs to tangle? That has been going on for, uh, for, for several decades. So, <clears throat> Let's talk about the neurofibrillary tangles, NFTs first. And I have a picture over here of uh, Professor Khalid Iqbal. Uh, he's the chairman of, uh, um, of neuroscience in, uh, in, in, in New York. And he, is, he will be the speaker here as well. And then uh, the, in, right next to her is uh, her uh, late wife, uh, uh, Dr. Inga Grunke Iqbal. Uh, very nice couple. The, the reason I have their picture in here is because the whole, uh, the whole concept of NFT and uh, what involves in that was actually brought by uh, Dr. Inga Gurungi Iqbal and Professor Iqbal. And when I was doing my PhD uh, Alzheimer's disease and I came across these papers, and you can imagine how excited I was uh, when I met them in one of the conferences in 1991 in Toronto. And then after that, you know, uh, I have had a chance to work with Dr. Iqbal and uh, he, he has uh, been uh, the chief guest in one of the annual neuroscience conferences. Uh, you know, I have the honor of hosting him at my house. Uh, it's a pleasure. Unfortunately, Dr. Inga uh, Grundyakpal, she passed away in, I think, 2012. Uh, very nice. Uh, the, the couple is a very nice couple. And, and Dr. Iqbal has a, has a wonderful uh, track record of, of research. Uh, he is, uh, he, I think in 2007, the Alzheimer's Association of USA established the Khalid Iqbal Lifetime Achievement Award in his name. And it's given out uh, uh, annually at the International Conference on Alzheimer's Disease. So you can imagine, you know, the, the influence uh, uh, Professor Iqbal has uh, on this. And I think you will hear him tomorrow. So don't miss that talk. Okay, this is, you know, he's is one of the top guys in the world. <clears throat> on Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so coming back to uh, coming back to the top. So so uh, in, in a neuron they have uh, cytoskeletons. Uh, there are uh, actin which is involved in movement and growth cones and synaptogenesis, and there are microtubules involved in transporting of stuff back and forth between nucleus and the far at far reaches of the neuron. And uh, the microtubule is, is uh, involves some microtubule associated protein that gives it little stability and 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 is involved in process uh, where the microtubule is going to polymerize and depolymerize because it's a dynamic structure. So one of those microtubule associated protein is tau. And how a lot of these proteins work, they work because of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. <clears throat> so of course, phosphorylation and dephosphorylation is an important aspect of tau protein uh, as it works on the, on the microtubule. But then an abnormally hyperphosphorylation of this tau protein occurs for uh, reasons not totally known, which leads this all to come together and 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 become a tangle, and that's what leads to NFT. So here, you know, first motive, right? That it's again accumulation. It's a it's a hyperphosphoryl abnormally hyperphosphorylated tau, uh, which is a microtubule associated protein. When it comes together. It forms the tangles, and here we see in a in a in a, in a tau molecule that is stabilizing the macrotubule over here. 
this is a neuron, this is an axon, and there's a multitude that they're showing in this one. <clears throat> And and uh, uh, you know if if uh, once it uh, starts to disintegrate, uh, the abnormally phosphorylated uh, tau protein they starts to accumulate and makes the make, makes the tangle. Uh, so so that's the uh, so that that was the NFTs. Now coming to the uh, um, the senile plaques. So senile plaque is uh, is. Uh, is just an extracellular accumulation of this of this protein, which is about 37 to 49 amino acids, and they are called uh, beta amyloid. And uh, uh, they they accumulate outside the cell, but then there's something with this accumulation which probably may be toxic also. Um, so here is a, is a little um, artistic artist's uh, picture over here, the neurons and over here, and then the signal plaque over here. And for some reason, these amyloid beta oligomers, and, and this is the picture of my mentor, uh, Bill Klein. He, he was uh, my PhD advisor at Northwestern. So he, he has done a lot of work on Alzheimer's disease too. Um, so the, the so amyloid beta oligomer, uh, is is a hypothesis that probably uh, I think Rachel Neve was she was from Harvard she she showed that you can sprinkle that little amyloid uh, polymer on a neuronal culture and the neurons start to die and that was taken further uh, by our lab I had left the lab by that time however um, uh, taken further by our lab and uh, the amyloid beta oligomer hypothesis was introduced and uh, and you know uh, the 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 role of in pathogenesis as well as its role in <clears throat> how to use um, um, uh, different treatment strategies to prevent that uh, has been looked at. But what happens is these these oligomers they are neurotoxic. So when they circulate uh, in the CSF or in the blood, they can be detected in the blood. When they are circulating in the CSF, they can be toxic and call, uh, cause uh, neurons to die. Uh, so what is what is amyloid uh, uh, beta amyloid? So beta amyloid actually comes from a precursor protein called amyloid precursor protein APP. You know, simple name, right? Amyloid beta protein APP. So APP, the role of APP is not absolutely known, but it may be involved in in synaptogenesis, in maintenance of the synapses, and uh, maybe iron transport. Uh, it's a it, it, it's it's still being looked at. But it has definitely has a very important role in uh, in the in the nervous system, uh, and and one of the most important role is probably uh, syn synaptogenesis uh, or synapse regulation. Now this protein it occurs in different forms and it is a transmembrane protein. Uh, it can uh, because of different isoforms it can have slightly different function and then it is uh, cleaved by by secretase. Secretase are are a proteases that work on these kind of uh, transmembrane proteins and then they release these molecules. These molecules may have different function as they diffuse out. So this uh, this is the normal. So if you look over here, this is an APP. This is outside, this is inside amyloid precursor protein. And uh, uh, if it's cleaved in at certain locations, then that will release the, uh, the soluble APPs, soluble amyloid precursor proteins. And they have a lot of function. They can they can actually provide the neuroprotective function. On the other hand, whereas if it is cleaved at the wrong sites uh, by by certain uh, beta and uh, gamma uh, uh, beta secretases, that would lead to this um, beta amyloid, which has a tendency of coming together, and um, that is as the uh, is what leads to uh, amyloid plug. And then, and then that is toxic, which causes the neurons and all those the uh, synapses to degenerate and die. And how does it work? Really, we don't know. Um, uh, there's a raft theory where all these proteins in the membrane they go together like a raft. They, uh, although APP is not part of that raft, but then uh, somehow the incorporation of APP in the raft may lead it to a, a, a different kind of a processing uh, and protease is working on that one so we don't know exactly what causes that there is, there is a lot of uh, um, um, research obviously going on there the, but there are some genetic uh, um, uh, um, some some familial uh, Alzheimer's disease as well and and those have uh, a slightly different uh, amyloid precursor protein 
which have a tendency to um, be cleaved at certain sites and that leads to uh, beta amyloid production uh, and that that was that was discovered back in back in late 80s and early 90s so we don't know a lot of reason for uh, alzheimer's disease uh, we know that nft is probably playing a role uh, senile plaques <clears throat> amyloid precursor may be playing a central role uh, there are some genetic uh, um, uh, variants in there uh, which may be uh, responsible for uh, these changes. There was a cholinergic hypothesis, which is sort of uh, not really favored now. There was a hypothesis of aluminum as a toxic, not really uh, important. So amyloid hypothesis is actually more, uh, more um, um, uh, established now and, and, and it's being worked on, but then still we don't know a, a total uh, how the amyloid protein works in it. But then one of the things that, that uh, has been uh, shown uh, by um, uh, Alan Roses, and he passed away a few years ago. He was at Duke University. Uh, he, he showed that uh, that the genetic factors that affect, besides the uh, um, the uh, presendilin and things like that, uh, the genetic factor that affects uh, Alzheimer's disease is is uh, lipid metabolism. That's interesting. It just came out of the blue because people were looking at the amyloid plaques and NFTs, and and suddenly uh, this gentleman comes out. And says, "Hey, you know, apple apple protein E may be important." And his hypothesis was, and it's still, and it's just that there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion that uh, was done around it. I remember that you know I was a young graduate student at those times, so I had done my PhD, and I got up in a meeting and I just had a big argument with him, uh, you know, because I did not know a whole lot at that time, probably. So his 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 theory has has uh, survived and actually is uh, getting a lot of traction now. So according to it, basically, you know, there, there are these um, missiles, the lipoproteins the, uh, that, that, can, that transport the lipid material, and there are a lot of other protein involved in it. And one of the embedded protein that is involved in making it sure that it is transported correctly and not disintegrates is called apolipoprotein. Apolipoprotein E and its variant 4 has been linked to Alzheimer's disease. So ApoE4, apolipoprotein E. Uh, uh, went, went for right. So apparently, astrocytes and and macroglia, you know, uh, they are um, present along with the neurons, and uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, environmental influence that that affects these uh, the health of a neuron. And uh, if uh, for some reason this pro-inflammatory response, the deficient glucose metabolism, the lipid dysregulation, the uh, 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 deficient amyloid beta clearance. All that thing would lead to Alzheimer's uh, disease. And how does it do that? It's hard to say, but this reactive oxygen species can damage the neurons. And if you have a different uh, variant of apolipoprotein E, then uh, the lipid particles can be uh, consumed and, and metabolized. But if you don't have, if you have apolipoprotein E4, uh, then that will uh, somehow lead to degeneration of the neurons. Uh, and again, it's a it's a, a big science behind it, uh, still being worked out. So uh, I, I can't uh, really uh, I don't have time to talk more about it, and I'm not really an expert an expert of of all these things. But enough to remember that the that different kind of uh, insults that that you see in here, and, and I I'm just taking my glasses off because uh, here it is written also. You know, you can read this um, all these one, but then. Uh, uh, the main thing that that stands behind it, the inflammation, the reactive oxygen species, and all that thing that eventually uh, causes damage to the neurons. If you have ApoE4, then the neuron does not recover from it and needs the de de degeneration. And then the theory that that uh, that Alan Roses had actually is that when the neurons start to degenerate, that's when they start to produce, uh, you know, all this material which is beta uh, amyloid and and neurofibrillary tangles and because of that we get accumulation of synaptic uh, senile uh, plaques and nfts so that's actually uh, further down uh, it's not the, they are not the cause of all this thing so again you know there's a whole big uh, group of scientists who think that a beta oligomer uh, apo as we saw uh, not the apo uh, this stuff uh, you know um, amyloid amyloid beta oligomer a b a beta o uh, this one uh, is neurotoxic and here he talks about e4 
is the cause of all that thing. So the jury is still out, but uh, one can still uh, understand the pathogenesis. Uh, you know, when I was finishing my PhD in 1991, the uh, the genes for APP uh, came out, and uh, I had worked so many years for uh, Alzheimer's disease, and I said, hey, you know, it's all is out now. My thesis is going to be useless. Um, and that was 1991 and it's still 30 years and we still we don't have a clear clue that what causes Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but then we know more about the pathogenesis. Uh, okay, all right, moving on to the next one is, uh, is uh, another neurodegenerative disease and that's called Huntington's disease. Now, what happens in Huntington's disease, uh, this is uh, for those who have looked at the neuroscience, here's a patient with Huntington's disease. She has a coliform movement, it's just, you know, hands and all those things are, uh, unfortunately, uh, uncontrolled movement. Uh, the, the motor pathway uh, where the cerebral cortex goes to the caudate putamen, which goes to the globus pallidus, and then eventually the output goes to the uh, thalamus back to the cortex. This loop, which is direct loop as well as indirect loop, this loop is affected when there is a degeneration of caudate nucleus, uh, and, and, and which, causes, uh, uh, which causes less inhibition from this uh, basal ganglion to the thalamus, which causes more excitation of thalamus to the frontal cortex, and then all these movements start to happen. Exactly opposite of this happens in Parkinson's disease, which will show us something. Yes. Okay. All right. So, so what happens in all, in 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 in, in, uh, in Huntington's disease is uh, is that there's a degeneration of the caudate head. So those who have gone through little neuroanatomy, they will understand this point that that uh, the, that uh, you know there's uh, 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 over here uh, you have uh, in this MRI this is the axial section this is a caudate head over here and this is the MRI of an of a Huntington's patient the caudate is atrophied and in a real pathological specimen you again see the caudate is atrophied over here but then atrophy goes beyond that this paper was written by uh, by uh, by by uh, George. Uh, Huntington in 1872 and he was just 22 years old so guys you know remember that you can uh, uh, write some seminal paper and good, do some excellent work uh, even if you are young um, you know G.D. Watson he was what 24 when he finished his research on the uh, on the uh, on the, uh, on, the, on, the on the DNA I think yeah, 24 something like that. So anyway, all right. Moving on. Uh, so so the Huntington's disease. Why 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 do those uh, caudate nuclei degenerate? We don't know exactly why only they degenerate and the whole brain does not degenerate. But then what what is known is that the 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 genetic basis is is what we call as trinucleotide repeat disorder. And in the trinucleotide repeat disorder, what happens is that in the it's now known that in the both in the exons and in the introns, uh, the the codon, which is a uh, which is a tri uh, three nucleotides, if they are repeated too many times for certain uh, amino acids, they accumulate and cause the malfunction of the protein when it's expressed. And now it's been found that it's actually present in the introns also, even in in those sequences of DNA which are not expressed into proteins. So some of the first one that was found was actually fragile X syndrome. And that was because of the codon CGG, which was repeated. CGG uh, codes for arginine, so it's repeated uh, uh, in a normally in a normal wild type. Uh, you may have six to fifty-three of these repeats, but then in a pathogenic type, you may have two and thirty plus. So there are different kinds of uh, trinucleotide repeats that have uh, shown up, and then one specific, which is poly Q. Poly Q is basically glutamic uh, is a glutamic acid. Uh, the this one is is uh, uh, mainly because of the uh, of the CAG repeat and uh, so so the the uh, the, uh, the 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 ones that is uh, known is is Huntington disease in the Huntington in the Huntington pro, uh, Huntington protein uh, normally you can have six to thirty five uh, poly Q repeats but in the in those patients that are going to get the disease. You have more than 35 and they may be as high as 250 repeats and and this is because of mutation so you can have a few repeats of that amino acid and when the amino acid is expressed it it, it goes through uh, a conformational change and if you have some extra amino acids which are not causing problem the, the protein may still conform 
and, and have a functional ability. But then if you have too many amino acids, then that of a certain kind by mutation, then the conformation may not take place and the functionality of the protein may be lost. So that's what happens over here. The Huntington protein is a part of the uh, <clears throat> um, uh, complex that actually is involved in the expression of uh, certain proteins. And, and, and this, this again, like, like, uh, like many other uh, things uh, in the neurodegenerative disorders, it is expressed in a lot of cells, but it, is very, it has a very important role in synapses in the nervous system. And uh, so, so what happens is that here's a normal, let's say, which is less than 35 CAG repeats. And then, you know, it produces a protein, which is a uh, non-mutated Huntington, Huntington protein. But then if there are too many repeats, then there are too many uh, uh, because of CAG repeats. And then because of that, there are uh, too many amino acids that are expressed over here. And, and because of that, the conformation of this, uh, of this protein is affected. And and the and when when its conformation is affected, it doesn't have a, 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 a same function, and and that leads to a degeneration of the neuron over here. So, <clears throat> but why only three repeats? Why not four repeats? Why not two repeats? Because think about it: if you have four repeats, for example, uh, so instead of CAG, there's a mutation that causes CAGA. Then that then the whole sequence of of uh, of the uh, codons will change. And the whole protein will change, which would cause the protein to be totally uh, lethal. That will be lethal mutation. But with the three repeat, it will just insert one extra amino acid, and the protein will still come out with maybe a couple of extra amino acid of certain kind. And because of that, it may still function, but not function so well. So it will not be lethal, but then eventually it will cause the disease. Cause the disease. And that's why a triple nucleotide repeat is a disease entity by itself uh, with a lot of diseases. And if you look over here. Besides the Huntington's disease, there are a lot of Spanish cerebellar ataxia, which comes into the CAG repeats. And then there are <clears throat> other Friedrich's ataxia and other cere Spanish cerebellar ataxia, which has a different uh, codon CTG. Uh, so it's a, it's a whole big list of things over here. Okay. So moving on now. Uh, so, so, okay. So we talked about, if you look over here, uh, did you see this Friedrich's ataxia over here? Right. So that's, that is because of trimetrotide repeat as well. So Friedrich's ataxia, you can, if this look at this picture, that will give you some idea that uh, basically the patient has a lot of degeneration of the spinal cord, has a problem with walking and, and coordination, and they die young, these poor souls. Uh, this, is an, uh, this, is an, uh, this is a pathological specimen of the spinal cord. If you look at the dorsal column, the lateral column, they're all degenerated. And uh, the, the genetic uh, uh, transmission of this disease uh, uh, is talked about. But what is the basic of this thing? Apparently, uh, the IRP1 is, uh, is uh, probably involved in it, and uh, IRP1 and then frataxin, and these are involved in the met metabolism of uh, uh, iron, uh, and uh, the mitochondrial function, mitochondrial function is, is, um, is damaged. But why? the damage of the uh, um, uh, mitochondrial function will affect only these ones we don't know exactly uh, but but this is the main uh, uh, pathology behind that and, and 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 that that degeneration eventually leads to a lot of problems but then one of them is the detention of the nervous system which then eventually uh, leads to uh, uh, als um, sulfuric ataxia now <clears throat> next is als so I'm sure you guys have, uh, most of you have watched this movie. If you have not, I will strongly recommend to watch this movie. And this is, uh, you know, one of the great uh, geniuses of our time who passed away um, a couple of years ago in 2018. And that was Stephen Hawking. And Stephen Hawking's book, uh, Brief History of Time, is one of the best books, uh, the top 25 books in my list. Uh, so so this movie is about his life, life you know, how he ended up with this ALS. Now, ALS is a very bad disease. He was one of those people who stabilized and lived for uh, up to the age of 70 plus. But otherwise, when the ALS strikes you and, and uh, you know, uh, you, you, you don't live more for more than a few years um, because uh, first your, your speech and all your thing is affected and then your movement of your hands and all those things swallowing is affected and your respiration gets affected. So you become wheelchair bound, you may become ventilator dependent. And you know, uh, some people just decide to die. I, one of my very close friends, brother, 
he got ALS with, you know, he had, a, had got married, had two small kids. And he said, and he said that, you know, I don't want to live on a ventilator and I just want to go. So it's a, it's a sad thing. It's a sad, it's a sad disease. Uh, but, but then uh, it, the progression of ALS is different in different people. And in, in, in uh, Stephen Hawking, it progressed slowly and he was somehow able to survive that and, and was, I mean, think about it, if he had died uh, in two or three years after it came on, uh, we would have missed all these uh, knowledge that he imparted on us. So lucky for us, he suffered through it, but that's a great movie, you should watch that. Anyway, so what happens in ALS is, uh, is, uh, is <clears throat> um, the, um, it, there's a lot of atrophy. It's, uh, it's, it, the name is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's a motor neuron disease. The motor neurons are affected both in the brain and as they give impulses down to the spinal cord and, and the motor neurons of the spinal cord they get affected too so so here you see that the uh, that you know there's a corticospinal tract is affected over here and then the motor neurons in the anterior horn will be affected um so, uh, so and, the, and here the mri shows uh, those who have seen mri they will understand this that you know there's a slight hyper intensity that you see in this direction and this is the corticospinal tract that is shown regeneration. This is the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Again, the corticospinal tract. These two dots suggest that the spine, that the cortical pyramidal tracts are regenerating. Now, why do I have a picture of this gentleman over here? This is Dr. Tipu Siddiq, and I would I always love to show these pictures because you know, like Dr. Khalid Iqbal, and you know, these are all people from Pakistan who have done big things. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, um, uh, Professor Tipu Siddiq is at Northwestern, and you know Northwestern is where I did my PhD. So there's a connection there also. Uh -huh. And uh, so he actually was this one who discovered the gene the uh, first time, the gene that is uh, that plays a role in ALS. And it turned out to be uh, he he did he did this discovery with Bob Brown, um, um, and this is, he was I think he was in at, at Duke in those days of Harvard. I don't remember. He was not at Northwestern at that point. So anyway, uh, so 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 he discovered that there's a there's a, a genetic problem with those familial um, ALS patients, and that is because of superoxide dismutase. Now superoxide dismutase is important in taking care of all these reactive oxygen species, and the damage of this uh, was the was the reason for ALS. <clears throat> it turns out that actually they inherited motor neuron disease. Uh, they they are a, a, sm a much smaller portion. The majority of them are actually sporadic, and uh, there are different variants in there. But eventually, it's the degeneration of the motor neurons, starting from here, from the motor cortex, going down to the spinal cord, into the anterior horns, and then going to the muscles. So the degeneration of these neurons that's called motor neuron disease. And uh, one of the important proteins that that turns out to to play a role is called the uh, um, is TR DNA binding protein, and and uh, TDP forty three. Uh, so about ninety five percent of ALS patients are actually suffering uh, have their abnormality in the in the uh, in the function of TDP forty three, and and TDP forty three is is a critical component of. Uh, certain enzymic pathways uh, which uh, are involved in these uh, in repairing the dna double strand breaks so again uh, you know a lot of biochemistry behind that uh, don't have time to discuss that but you can remember that the tdb43 plays an important role in most of these diseases and tdb43 uh, uh, ha does some repair mechanism <clears throat> And, and here uh, we, we can see that uh, a, a hyperphosphorylated and a ubiquitinated uh, cleat form of TD43 is the pathogenic form and uh, that can uh, cause problems. I think we are running short of time also, so I need to move fast as well. Uh, but uh, just, just to give you enough idea that the, uh, the, the deposition of intracellular ubiquitin uh, inclusion in these motor neurons is one of the leading cause of uh, mechanism of ALS, and and the and the and, and TDP43 plays an important role in there. It's, TDP43 is mainly distributed in in the neurons, a nucleus of neurons, and and as I mentioned, it uh, repair of DNA and uh, also affects the RNA transcription and 
and a lot of other uh, transcriptional machinery. Uh, so we don't exactly know that how the TDP43 is affected and how, why would the TDP43 affect only these motor neurons. Um, um, it has been shown to bind to both DNA and RNA and have multiple functions. So, uh, but then at least we start to know, uh, we have at the beginning of, uh, beginning of some knowledge that TDP43 is the main problem. But then remember, we just talked about the superoxide dismutase, right? So it turns out that the damage to the neurons can happen from different uh, sources. And why certain kind of damage would lead to certain kind of disease, we don't know. So in the, in this, in the motor neuron disease, uh, or a particular kind of spinal muscular atrophy, which is a kind of a motor neuron disease, superoxide dismutase is obviously mutant SOD1 is important in there. But then TDB43 is also plays a role in it. Uh, and then there are a lot of other maybe glutamate excitotoxicity, that's a whole different field of uh, uh, the glutamate, glutamate NMD receptors can lead to excitotoxicity if they are overactivated versus uh, their normal role. Uh, and then, and then um, you know, how the microglia, when they release the inflammatory mediators, the, uh, uh, the cytokines and, and, uh, and all those stuff, how will they affect uh, the certain uh, uh, ionic pumps? So, so we are still very far, and the mitochondrial, dis mitochondrial dysfunction may also be affected by, by uh, the calcium metabolism and other oxidative stress. So we are still very far to, from understanding what causes these kind of motor neuron diseases. But then we are beginning to understand that yes, you know, it's a damage to the neurons because of probably, probably the uh, oxidative stress and other inflammatory stresses. Okay. So uh, move on. Uh, so one of the one of the uh, one of the degenerative diseases related to the um, motor neuron disease. I just want to mention it over here. Uh, this is a great scientist that uh, because of our uh, thinking style of this nation, we lost him. Uh, he actually um, uh, you know, uh, did a lot of work. Uh, and and is, in, there are Nobel laureates, and then there are Nobel laureates. He's one of those. Nobel laureates who actually did an excellent work. Um, so so uh, he, he died uh, because of uh, progressive supranuclear palsy. That's a disease that he has. And what, what PSP does is that uh, it, you know, um, it, it starts to come uh, around in the 60s. And the, the brain is stem, particularly the midbrain, and certain cerebellar nuclei and certain deep nuclei, they start to degenerate. And these patients start to get into dysphagia and and coordination problems and, and, and speech problems, then gait problems and eventually dementia. Uh, they, they do not respond so well to levodopa like other Parkinson's disease patients do. And uh, eventually, uh, eventually uh, you know, uh, they die. Now, the interesting thing is that in the PSP, if you look at, uh, if you study that, you again find the tangles, the NFTs. Now, these NFTs are a little different from Alzheimer's disease. They are different shape, but then again, tau is involved in it. So, you know, it's the same tau, same, uh, you know, problem over here, but why is the person getting PSP versus somebody getting Alzheimer's and all that thing, we don't know. Uh, chromosome 17 may have a certain H1 haplotype of this tau protein, which may be involved in, in creating this disease. Uh, so, you know, uh, one of those diseases, but I, it's, it's a rare disease, but the reason I mentioned it because uh, uh, it affected someone that I respect a lot as a scientist, uh, one of the best in, 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 from our country. Okay, uh, so now we come to uh, the the mad cow disease. A lot of people know about mad cow disease, right? And uh, beef uh, eating on beef, you you think about that. The 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 the, the origin of mad cow disease actually is the disease Kuru that was discovered by uh, Carlton Yajusek. Uh, Carlton Gadusek uh, got a Nobel Prize for that. He studied this tribe in, 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 New, in Papua New Guinea, near New Zealand. And these patients, um, they had this shake, and that's why the word Kuru comes from. He found that, uh, you know, there was a ritualistic cannibalism in them there, and there are different versions of that. So some, some people write uh, uh, that, uh, you know, when, they, when, when, when people die in that tribe, of, as a ritual, they eat their uh, body parts. 
uh, in some other places I've read the version that actually they don't eat, but what they do is they take their brain and out of respect, they, they, they smear the brain on their body. Now, either way, there's a transmission of the disease. I wish I, 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 I am not an expert of uh, uh, Kuru. I, I don't know exactly what version is right. I met uh, Carlton Gadjusek uh, back in the same conference in 1991 that I met Dr. Khalid Iqbal, which was on Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Interesting, isn't it? And um, I wish I had asked him then. <clears throat> so he had a bad falling, this gentleman, though, some pedophilia issues. Okay. Um, anyway, so 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 this thing uh, that uh, the disease uh, is a transmission, and for the longest time, uh, so so it's the same kind of a disease, same kind of transmission, which is called mad cow disease, eating by certain bee which are infected by uh, that uh, um, infectious particle. Now this is one of those uh, neuro neurodegenerative disease that's not because of genetic disorder, or maybe it's genetic disorder. I will tell it to you in a minute but it is because of an infectious particle. Now, for the longest time, uh, we thought it, it was a slow virus and actually uh, Carlton Gadjusek uh, also proposed, it's a slow virus that causes degeneration of, these, uh, of the brain and it's called spongiform encephalopathy. Uh, and then mad cow disease was related to that as well. Uh, but then it turns out that actually uh, it's not a slow virus. It's a special protein called prion and uh, and, and that was discovered by Stanley Prusner. Stanley Prusner, uh, interestingly, I met Stanley Prusner also at that conference, by the way. He, he, he hadn't received Nobel Prize at that point. Okay, so Stanley Prusner uh, was in, in UCSF, he was a neurologist, and he got interested in this patient on the spongiform encephalopathy and started to study that. And he had to face a lot of, um, a lot of, um, um, pushback and, and a lot of criticism because every time he would analyze that infectious particle, there would be no DNA, no RNA, no nucleic acid in there. And he came up with, the, with this theory that this infectious particle is transmitted without any nucleic acid. Now that was absolutely against whatever was known about the hereditary transmission, right? Even the viruses had nucleic acids in there. So that's why he, he faced this criticism for longest time. But eventually uh, it was established and he got a Nobel Prize. The, so the word the prion comes from the protease resistant protein. It's a very hard protein. And the, the, the prion protein in a, uh, is actually a normal protein um, uh, involved in, in, in a function of uh, uh, cell membrane uh, stabilization and things like that. And again, uh, uh, surprise, surprise, they play an important role in, in synapse uh, metabolism and, and all those things, right? So, uh, uh, um, so, uh, so, 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 the, so, so, if a normal protein is 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 cleave in an abnormal way, uh, that leads to the cleave, cleavage of other normal protein into abnormal way, and that starts to aggregate. And this aggregation basically kills the cell. You know, again, motive of aggregation, right? And actually, it's a it's a it's a genetic problem in a way. Um, so, so this particle, which is actually an abnormally cleaved protein, can become an infectious particle because if you put it in some other uh, brain, it will cause the same problem. It's so infectious, in fact, that uh, if we do, uh, now we don't do a biopsy of this, there are other ways, but then when I was doing my residency training in neurosurgery, we would do a biopsy to prove, by, to get these histopathological samples. And if it was spongiform encephalopathy, the whole OR will be shut down, it will be washed again and again, because even the slightest of these particles, if they can be transmitted to some other person, that person will start to get. So it's, it's, a, it's a highly infectious particle, but then there's no DNA or RNA, RNA in it. Okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, I have a few more minutes. It's an hour left, right? Okay. So we are now, now we are coming to uh, Parkinson's disease. So remember, after Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's is another neurodegenerative disease which is very well known. So, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's characterized by uh, us, uh, you know, those who have done neuroanatomy would know that uh, there's a basal ganglia in here in the deep in the brain, and the part of the basal ganglia is the substantial nigra in the midbrain, and the substantial nigra projects the dopaminergic neurons to the uh, caudate in 
Um, and here's the diagram over here. So according to Putaman, this is substantial anger between the dopaminergic neurons. And the degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons leads to imbalance of this direct and indirect pathway which goes to the subthalamic nucleus. Eventually, it all goes to thalamus and from thalamus to the, to the uh, forebrain. So uh, this balance in that leads to this problem uh, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, their patients, you know, they become rigid or they have shakes or they have dyskinesia and things like that. Uh, and and in, in, uh, in almost all of these cases, the alpha synuclein protein is, is, uh, plays a, a very important role. And there are more than 100 sequence variants linked to uh, Parkinson's disease in the, in the alpha synuclein protein. And uh, the, uh, this, this protein is again, uh, uh, the Parkinson's disease can be sporadic, can be familiar form. Uh, and it does, it does affect the uh, dopaminergic neurons, but the SNCA uh, plays a very, a very significant role in it. And if you look at this figure, I don't know how clearly that's coming out there, but there are a lot of variants in there. Uh, and, uh, um, but then the most common one is the alpha synuclein. but then there are other proteins like Parkin and other proteins as well, but this is the most common one. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this alpha synuclein is, uh, is again uh, the same protein which aggregates in, in a very common dementia, which is after Alzheimer's. And then, then so one, one dementia can come from Alzheimer's, the other dementia can come from a vascular uh, um, because of blood vessels, you know, um, not giving enough oxygen and mini strokes and those kind of things happening. And then the third one is the Lewy body disease. And this in this dementia is the same protein, the uh, the uh, misfolded proteins, synuclein, maybe uh, uh, alpha synuclein is playing an important part, and it accumulates inside in the uh, in this in the neuron, uh, but not in the nucleus. <clears throat> and these are called Lewy bodies, and they're called Lewy body dementia. Now the thing is that this. Uh, uh, as, as I said, after the Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, it's the most common dementia, and it's called Lewy body dementia. But then, the, but the Lewy bodies are also found in Parkinson's disease as well, and Parkinson's disease is related to alpha synuclein. So, so we don't really understand, and even if you understand, we can't just clean, cleanly categorize that this is uh, this is uh, Pakistan, this is India, this is China, this is uh, Iran. You know, with boundaries, we can't do that. There's a lot of overlap among these neurodegenerative diseases. You can see example over here. This kind of Lewy bodies can be found in a lot of uh, 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 in a lot of uh, Parkinson's patients, whereas a lot of dementia, uh, one of the most common dementia, one of the top three dementias, is Lewy body disease, which has the self So, so I, so, so, so I would like the uh, the audience to leave this uh, lecture totally confused, because I want to confuse you, because the idea is. That we are all confused that you know uh, we don't know for sure exactly what is uh, how we can define things but then we know a lot more than what we knew 20 years ago 50 years ago 100 years ago uh, that's the that's the beauty of knowledge it confuses you because in confusion i'm using in a, in, a, in a different way meaning that there are a lot of questions that come in your mind and you say okay it's not like that we know more but then we realize we there's much more to know uh, and and this is an example of that louis body disease how uh, accumulation, and you can see in this in this picture, and how actually the, this this uh, this aggregate can be transmitted from one neuron to the other, either directly through the synapses, or as as uh, released and then and then endocytosed uh, over here, which which leads me to uh, to actually uh, we can skip this one, which leads me to this that that. At that alpha synuclein actually uh, can uh, there's a theory that's coming up that how the gut microbiota may be playing an important role in creating these neurodegenerative diseases in alzheimer's disease and uh, in, in parkinson's disease and all that thing the bacteria in your gut in, i mean it, there are more cells if, if you count the number of cells there are more bacteria in in our body than our own cells. So, so you know, as a as a human being, I'm more bacteria than I'm than I'm myself. And and uh, there is there are more uh, ten times probably more genes because of my bacteria and other microbials 
than the genes that I inherited. And I started to have this flora in my gut the day I was born. And then I inherited that flora partly from my parents uh, because, you know, when, when, my, when my mother uh, breastfed me, the bacteria, when she fed me through her hands, you know, all those things, they inhabited my gut. And, uh, and a healthy bacterial flora in my gut uh, leads to a healthy brain. Uh, that is a concept that's coming up. Uh, and what we eat, how it affects the bacterial flora, the use of antibiotics and other problems can affect all these things. Is, is something that people are realizing. Uh, so gut micro, uh, microbiota uh, plays an important role. And here is uh, something that has been discovered about the, uh, about the Parkinson's disease, that how alpha-synuclein actually can be produced over here and then absorbed uh, by the gut endothelium. And then from there, uh, by the enteric glia, and then transmitted to these neurons of, from, of the vagus nerve, which goes from the brain stem all the way down here. And then from here, it can be then transported to other neurons, which eventually leads to death of those uh, uh, substantial nigra neurons causing Alzheimer's disease. So is there something, I mean, it's not established, it's, it's being worked out, it's being studied, but then uh, it's, I just wanted to bring the attention of, of uh, this group that has come for IBRO school to look at all these different aspects of the neurodegenerative diseases uh, how from genetics to environmental factors to 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 prions to even your gut flora can be leading to that and uh, and there are different mechanisms of all that. So I think uh, yeah I have done. That. That's all, folks. So I will stop sharing here and uh, thank you very much for listening to patiently. Uh, so, Dr. Sadaf, do we have a uh, question and answer session or are we just... Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Sir, there are some questions and I will be uh, able to narrate you. But if anyone have the question, so they can unmute themselves and ask here uh, if any of these participants have questions. I mean, you have you have some uh, excellent Dr. Khair Bal, Professor Khair Bal is coming here also. So um, read more about it in the next few days, and uh, you will understand uh, what uh, these people tell you about uh, these. Sir, uh, we have some questions. Uh, one question is that if you can give the general idea of how these mutations kick a start and which external factor most likely to trigger this, you know, so. Can yeah so i so we don't know exactly there can there can be multitude of external factors that can cause that but i think the most common external factor is the oxidative stress that's what it looks like uh, uh, we are constantly uh, dealing with uh, this reactive oxygen species uh, you know hydrogen peroxide superoxide and all that thing and and i think inflammation uh, with uh, with changes in the uh, uh, cytokine environment uh, so all that probably is is uh, plays a role in it okay are you you are okay yes sir sir the next question is is there any pathological way to control the functioning of NPFs NPF kya hai NPF Are we, we are frozen over here. Is it, is it me or is it? Oh. Am I, can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me now? Can you 
Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, Dr. Sadaf? Are you mute? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry, uh, we got disconnected. Sir, oh, okay. we also. So, what, what is NPF? I, 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 I couldn't understand. NPF, kya matlab? Is it's... there a way like genome mapping to detect and reverse the condition before its onset? Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I didn't understand what NPF was. Okay. But yes, I mean, you can do that um uh but that's uh, that's gen genetic engineering eventually uh, over time probably not not today uh but you know in the next few centuries we should be able to correct those things maybe even using crispr technology and things like that to uh fine tune um yes it can be because there are certain known genetics so for example huntington's disease huntington's disease if you find that you can work on that one Okay. Okay. Next. Sir, one question. One question that we have is that uh, is there a way to seize the effect of these mutations? Is there a way to sorry? Seize these mutations. Seize. Yes, sir. To stop stop the effect of these mutations. Yes. Yes. So so that all depends on the diseases, right? But I can tell you, um, even in Alzheimer's disease, for example, <coughs> the, the, the idea of, uh, of the Alzheimer's uh, beta oligomers and how they are neurotoxic. So uh, there are methods coming up how to use antibodies, immunotherapy to stop that, right? But then that's not working at the genetic level. Uh, then, for example, if it's ALS, Again, there's nothing that you can do about ALS. These patients die. Uh, but then diseases like cystic fibrosis and all that thing and using CRISPR technology, one can work at the genetic level uh, to uh, stop that. Uh, so, so it all depends. It, you know, every disease will have a different way of dealing with it. Um, but then we don't know a, a lot of details uh, of how actually the mechanism of all these diseases to begin with. Sir, uh, Devesh, uh, Devesh uh, Kumar Mishra has asked twice that if you can give us the idea about how pre or probiotics have effect over Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, uh, uh, it's not, nothing is established, uh, but, you know, uh, you can read, I don't, the data is not as strong that uh, use of good probiotics has beneficial effect on a lot of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so I will not, uh, I will just try to eat healthy. Uh, I will not start to gulp nine uh, capsules of uh, some probiotic. Uh, although I've, I've known one of my German friend, whenever he visits Pakistan, he takes uh, nine capsules of probiotics. And then he says he has never had any problem with the, with diarrhea in, in Pakistan whenever he visits Pakistan. So, uh, so, uh, so, so I don't know. There's, I mean, the jury is still out. The jury is still out. But uh, there are, we are looking at that. Yes, direction. sir. Sir, we have a lecture of Dr. Yong uh, one day after tomorrow. So he will be talking about some aspect of how gastrointestinal tract and these probiotics can Wonderful. have impact. So he will be sharing his own research. He is a gastroenterologist. Right, so right. maybe uh, we will have some yeah, answers. Yeah, there there there, there, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff that has come up, uh, and uh, and you know it it, it is interesting. That how the uh, microbiota biota uh, affects your your mental health and neurodegenerative diseases. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank All you right. so much, sir. Well, thank you very time. much. I wish and I could have uh, uh, stayed on, but then you know I have to go to the OR now. Uh, sir, you can join uh, anytime. These I will once, I, once I'm done with this. Once I'm done with this surgery, I will I will come back and join. Oh, okay, all the so best much. to you. And uh, I see, I see Naveed Sayed here. Naveed Slamalikum. Yes. And uh, who else is here? I I saw Doctor, uh, you know, Professor Khalid Iqbal earlier, but he's not here at this point. Uh, no, sir. Talk, talk, no. is here. Talk, Yes, sir. So, want yes. to give my salam and regards. Walaikum salam. Thank you, sir. It was very nice talk. Thank you so much. Nice to see you again. <laughs> okay. It's always, um, always a pleasure. To see you, um, Nambai, you've really done uh, 
phenomenal services to country as well as to the discipline of neuroscience. May Allah bless you for all your hard work. But 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 you are the one who is coming on CNN. You know, people talking about how you get uh, you know neurons to work with the with the uh, uh, with the electronics. So I and unfortunately I will miss your talk, Dr. Navid Sayyid. But I have listened to your talk so many times and so intently, and uh, you know I, I always enjoy your talks. But, but you uh, know, but uh, the um, Sadaf has twisted my arm, and she said, "No more chips." Today is brain masala, so, so I will just present brain masala uh, today, okay. and there will be no chips with it. So. All right, <laughs> all right, wonderful. But I will listen to the recorded talk later on. All the best, guys. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you, all thank right. you so much, sir. That was a very wonderful talk. Now let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Honorable Professor Dr. Navid Sayyid. Uh, let me tell you that it is uh, midnight uh, there in Calgary, and we are very much thankful and humbled that Sir has waited for us and joining for the talk. Uh, let me introduce uh, first uh, Dr. Naveed Sayed is a professor and scientific director of Alberta Children Hospital Research Institute, Cummings School of Medicine, University of Calgary. Dr. Sayed held the administrative position of postdoctoral program director, Office of Vice President from 2012 to 2016. He, in addition, he also worked as a special advisor to Vice President of Research uh, and the Chief Scientist at the Constructive Destructive Lab Global. He is currently the Peak Scholar at the University of Calgary. Getting his master's from University of Karachi and his PhD from University of Leeds in neurophysiology, he uh, has done his postdoctoral tra training in University of Calgary, and he was subsequently appointed as assistant professor at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Calgary. Dr. Sayed has received many international and national awards during his career, including a lot of awards, but to name few, Institute of Health Research Investigator Award, Fellowship of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. Uh, the Government of Pakistan awarded him the highest award, Tamra Imtiaz, Medal of Excellence, the highest civilian award for research and innovation. Dr. Sayyid is also recognized among 150 Canadian innovations and innovator on the occasion of Canada's 150th birthday this year, uh, last year, and has received the Canada 150 Medal by the Senate of Canada. Dr. Sayyid and his team are the first and the pioneer to help a bionic hybrid, which enables to direct dialogue between brain cells and the silicon chip. And this is one of the most highlighted study in the Time magazine and the Discovery Channel, Global Mail. And Dr. Sayyid has published more than 140 papers in prestigious peer-reviewed journal about uh, his researches, including Nature, Science, Neuron, and other journals. We are very much privileged that uh, Dr. Sayed is always here to uh, not only share his research with all of you, but all, always uh, being a mentor to the neuroscience people all around the world. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us and waiting for us for this uh, session. Um, thank you, um, Sada, for your kind introduction and, and really kudos to you and your team for putting, uh, you know, these meetings together. It, I know how difficult it is even here in North America or in the Western world to put together a conference of this caliber, but you always shine through and may you be blessed. Um, and I think we owe you a huge debt of gratitude for putting this together. Um, and, you know, every time when I have been invited and I have given talk physically there, I have picked up one or two students. And today, one of the students that I picked up, she's doing her PhD, Shada Batul, and we also fixed her up with a very good looking doctor, a handsome gentleman. So she'll be getting married. So, so tonight was the actual night the party was at my house. And so this is also my third talk today, and it is now almost past midnight. So good morning to everyone, and what a privilege and honor it is um, to be able to speak to you. If I could share my screen. Okay, thank you. Um, so today, um, you know, most people um, have been really listening to me about brain chip interfacing. 
But I will uh, take you today to on a very different journey that my lab has been involved in for quite some time. You know, my lab has made, you know, in addition to brain chip technology, 17 major discoveries that have changed the face of neuroscience, but they never come to um, limelight because of the chip. It's always overshadows. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about Alzheimer disease, which is of course this conference is about, is a neurodegenerative diseases. And I think this is an enigma that requires a paradigm shift, um, not only for understanding this particular disease, but its management as well as treatment. I think, let me give you my take home message in case um, I put you to sleep. The most important thing to remember is that most scientists, most people end up looking for their lost key in a parking lot or in a park under the lamppost. It's not because the key is there, it's because the light is there. So most people end up searching for a cure for a particular disease um, or if fundamental mechanisms under the lamppost where everybody else is looking, the key is really not there. So it's important for our young scientists to really start thinking about out of the box because we have not cured or treated Alzheimer's disease or any of the neurodegenerative diseases of the brain. So the most first important thing is to take courage and also take chances and think out of the box and maybe have a very different paradigm shift in the way we look at these diseases. The way I think about this is um, that if I walked into the auditorium where this conference were taking place you know, physically, and Sadov had asked me to fix the lighting in that room or the gas or pipeline, I would have obviously asked her to give me the line drawings um, of that room. And she would say to me, look, we don't know who built this room. I really have no line drawings or the, the plan for this room. So the, my next question would to her would have been, okay, give me hammer and a chisel so I can break through the drywall and see for myself where, um, you know, the pipelines may be and where the things may be. But then she would say to me, sorry, sir, we don't have any of those tools. Exactly this is what happens when a neurological, um, you know, neurologically challenged patient is presented to us in a clinical setting we don't know how things were put together in the first place. So wouldn't it have been really nicer for us to be present in that room when that room was being built? So we could do our line drawings, we could make our map and we have that map now. And if anything goes wrong, we could straight go into that area and try to fix the problem. So this really takes us into a paradigm shift where we would like to think about how mother nature put this brain together in the first place and then think about really how we can go about fixing it or making changes. When you think about human brain, it really is an enigma. There are tens of billions of brain cells there are more neurons in our brain than there are stars in the Milky Way. And it is extremely complex. But what is even more important to think about is that brain structures are biological, but the feeling and the sensations, emotion, conscious and unconscious part of the brain, they are not physical. And we have no real access to them. And we have no idea how those feelings, emotions, affections, learning, memory are really controlled. And, and, and so this is a major problem and that we have really a very complex system that is least understood on the planet. But what we have learned over the years that there are tens of billions of brain cells and these brain cells are interconnected by special structures, which we call them synapses. So synapse is really the junction through which and um, consider it as an embassy through which two countries can communicate with each other. And these synapses are also really in trillions in number. So you can imagine in a child's brain, there are 30,000 synapses every 10 minutes. It's just like you put kernels in a popper and they pop and you have no idea how, which one is going to pop 
and where it's going to pop. So these synapses, they when um, you know from functionally connected networks, they get together, they give rise to neuronal circuits and these neuronal circuits then elicit behaviors, be that learning, memory, cognitive functions, simple reflexes, complex motor patterns, motor behavior, sensory motor behaviors. And this is what really the behavioral repertoire is determined. But it's also important to remember that these neuronal circuits are actually not hardwired. They are not like computer, but they change all the time. And they will change in response to a stimulus or in response to an activity that we do. And we call those changes as synaptic plasticity. And this plasticity is the one that forms the basis for all learning memory and our cognitive functions, even our feeling and sensations. So this plasticity is really important. So in addition to neurons, synapses, neuronal circuits, you know, we know that genes play a very important role as Sadaf had just asked a question uh, to Dr. Inam as well, that these, some of these neuronal networks are genetically mapped and genetically programmed. But in human, it's actually the epigenetics. It's the after responses, the environmental factors that will shape the brain. So as compared to a monkey, our brain is only 25% developed at birth, whereas a monkey's brain is almost 80% or 75% developed at birth. So in case of monkey, the epigenetics doesn't really play any major role, but most brain circuitry is determined hardwired through genetic programs. So in this particular paradigm, you also have glial cells and these glial cells originally, they were thought as glue that they, they put things together, but now we have come to know that they play really major role in many, many normal function where they become the tripartite relationship between two synapses or two neurons and their interconnectivity. But I will also talk about glia as coming as one of the major player in many of these diseases, including the Alzheimer's disease. So remember that neurons, they make synapses, they give rise to neuronal circuits, which then elicits behavior, but these neuronal circuits are not hardwired. They undergo synaptic plasticity and this plasticity forms the basis for all learning and memory. So it's a really highly dynamic system which really changes all the time. And some of it is determined through genes, but epigenetic plays a very important role. And these are your environmental factors and early behavior or learning that is really critical. So this is what is summarized here. The neuron to neuron, we get synapses. And most neurons will communicate through these synaptic connections. And in part, it is um, you know, electrical impulses. And then they convert to chemical at the end of uh, at the nerve terminal. And these, um, uh, you know, the interactions between any two neurons, they're also supported by glial cells. And these glia, the astroglia, they not only provide the myelin sheet, but they also serve as really housekeeping uh, elements which clean up the debris and they play a very important role also in the functioning of the brain and the brain's functions. So when you look at a synapse, the reason I'm really showing you, because I'm going to give you a very different narrative than what people have already been pushing and looking for their key under the lamppost. And I'm going to send you into the darkness where you will be able to actually think out of the box. So these synapses are, you know, as we know, they're specialized asymmetric junctions between neurons. They are the functional unit of all nervous system functions. Their molecular composition really defines what a synaptic function will be. And the synaptic plasticity plays a very important role or adaptive role. Um, and, and for example, learning and memory. And if these synapses go haywire, so the cells, they fire together, they wire together. If they fire out of sync, they fall out of sync. So uh, then it gives rise to epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease and many other diseases when these synapses fail to function. So what we also know is that, you know, when you um, want to record from these neurons that form synapses, we use conventional techniques, both either in the intact brain or in the um, brain slices or in isolated uh, cultures where we can grow these neurons and we try to decipher 
how these brain cells really interact with each other. And so it's important we can use patch clamp, we can use sharp electrodes, we can use also chip recordings. And what we really find is that if you trigger action potentials in one cell or the presynaptic neuron, what you will, um, what you will see is that there are one for one excitatory postsynaptic potentials that are triggered in the interconnected cell. So this cell is talking to that neuron. But if you trigger a burst, which is really a short burst, you see a much bigger response. And then if you come back and you fire another action potential, um, what you see is that the synapse is potentiated as compared to previous EPSBs. So this really forms the basis of short-term memory or synaptic potentiation, which really um, allows brain cells to exhibit any learning and memory, be that short-term or long-term. So this is really the common method that we use to be able to record and try to figure out how brain cells communicate with each other. But the important thing about is that whenever this communication falls apart, we have diseases such as the Alzheimer's, which is really one of the most common cause of dementia among older adults and it results in the loss of cognitive functioning, your thinking ability is compromised. People do not remember. Often short-term memory is gone and they also cannot reason. So the reason component of the brain is gone and the, the behavioral ability to perform certain tasks is also really gone. It's a terrible, terrible debilitating disease. And now it is becoming the next pandemic because with aging population, it is going to hit us harder than COVID-19 as well. So, um, you know, Alzheimer's is, is a disease whereby um, it, it is a brain disorder that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills and eventually the ability to really, uh, you know, um, an individual cannot perform simple tasks. So when you think about brain or different brain regions, and this is where I would like you to focus is the memory processing, where you have a hippocampus in the brain. This is where learning and memory and many forms of learning and memory occurs. But we also know that the cortex now plays an important role. Any memory can be really simultaneously diversed into two areas. The one is your, um, your cortex and the other is a hippocampus. So when you think about memories, memory could be short-term and long-term. And I gave you an example of short-term memory, which sometimes is, is use dependent. Once you used it, it's actually gone. It's just like students preparing for their exam if the exam did not take place because of flooding, you ask them in the evening, they will still know the answer. But after they have taken the exam, you ask them the question, it's gone. So those short-term memory, it actually doesn't live very long in our brain. But when you think about long-term memory, it could be an explicit memory. An explicit memory is usually a really conscious. And you have to make a conscious effort for that. And then you have implicit memory, which is the unconscious. So when you think about the conscious part of your brain, it scans one, you know, um, uh, 42 um, uh, frames per second, whereas the unconscious part of your brain scans 1.2 million frames per second. So you know that the unconscious part of your brain, which is implicit, it also primes your brain it's mostly the procedural memory and it really involves motor functions. When you think about explicit memory, which is conscious, it could be episodic or it could be semantic. So semantic memories are general in the knowledge of the world, the things around us, which we use as sensory perceptions, the right side of the brain. And then the episodic memories, the events that happen to you personally. So this is something that you have experienced yourself it will form the basis for episodic memory. So, so the memories are really also an important component and a circuit that gets shot, um, you know, um, breaking down in patients who suffer from Alzheimer disease. And so the circuit that we really uh, pay attention to, and this is a serendipitous discovery for us that we were looking for, uh, you know, cholinergic neurons in the hippocampus and recording from those neurons or labeling them with different targets. We came to also realize that the genetic or environmental factors 
you know, um, uh, they are the one that, you know, are play uh, circuits all the time and throughout life, they change. There's a constant change that occurs. And we were looking at this change in hippocampus related to learning and memory um, in the intact brain or in also in the intact animals when we had implanted uh, chips in these areas. So when you think about the structure of hippocampus, you see that the CA3 area and then the CA1 area. Um, and what you see is the cortex layer two and three, they innervate both CA3 area as well as the dentigyrus. The dentigyrus neurons are really also the intermediary but the connections between CA3, which is the glutamatergic neurons, onto CA1 area, they really play a very important role in episodic memory, fear conditioning, many different kinds of memories um, that we do. So we were playing around with this particular um, uh, area of the brain, um, and then I will tell you what actually happened. What we found was that these synaptic connections between um, these neurons were really cholinergic. Um, and then when we uh, perturb cholinergic pathway, we came to the realization that the animal's learning and memory was compromised. And I will get back to you shortly, but let me get, get you a little bit more background on Alzheimer's disease. I think, as I said earlier, it's a tsunami in the waiting. It is named after you know, Alzheimer's in 1906. He noticed changes in the brain of an, an older, uh, she was actually not old, she was 50 uh, some years old lady who died of an unusual mental illness. Her symptoms included memory loss, language problems, unpredictable behavior. And after she died, he uh, autopsied her brain and examined the brain and found many abnormal clumps. And these are the amyloid plaques that Dr. Inan was also mentioning. And the, he saw really a plaque, a spaghetti noodle, all con, you know, conglomerated in, in her brain and tangled bundles of fibers that are now known as neurofibrillary tangles or tau tangles. So these are the two important words and these are two important theories as that either it's the amyloid plaque or it's the tau tangles that really mess up the brain structures. Um, and it's just like on Karachi to Hyderabad Highway when there is an accident and, or traffic jam, every traffic is clogged up. So neuronal communication, neuronal transport of proteins, everything else get affected that way. So it causes of the dementia can vary. It really depending on the type of the brain changes that one may be taking place. And other dementias, they also include Lewy body dementia. Then you have frontotemporal disorders and the endovascular dementia. So the dementia, or we call it together Alzheimer's disease, could really, it's a, it's a kind of a family of uh, different disorders, which could be the disorders of the Lewy body. They also result in dementia. Then you have frontotemporal disorder, and then you have vasculature where blood supply is really perturbed to certain parts of the brain, especially in the cortex and hippocampus. Now it's common for people, um, it's really common to have mixed dementia. So a combination of two or more types of dementia is often usually present. So from um, diagnosing a patient, it often becomes really difficult by looking at the behavioral repertoire uh, and their physical conditions as to define until and unless you do the autopsy and open up the brain, you wouldn't really know as to which particular kind of dementia they had. The plaque and the tangles in the brain, they are still considered some of the main features of Alzheimer's disease. Another feature is the loss of connection between neurons in the brain. And that is known as the cholinergic hypothesis, because as I said to you, these acetylcholine, uh, cholinergic neurons, they come from, uh, you know, the, the cort cortical um, areas, the cor cortical thalamic pathways, and then onto the hippocampus. And these uh, pathways, these neurons dump their acetylcholine onto glutamatergic synapses, and they modulate those synapses and potentiate them and create synaptic plasticity in that region. And so these three major hypotheses are really played in um, Alzheimer's disease. One is the amyloid plaque, the other is tau tangles, 
So these are the traffic jammers and then the cholinergic hypothesis where acid or cholinergic transmission, be that the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the brain okay. are either altered or we have alteration of input coming onto or the postsynaptic glutamatergic neurons not really being responsive to the release acetylcholine. So the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer disease, you know, of course, memory problems are typically one of the, you know, the first sign of cognitive impairments in, in Alzheimer's. Some people with memory problems have a condition, it's called mild cognitive impairment with, with this kind of MCI or mild cognitive impairment. People have more memory problems than normal for their age, but their symptoms do not really, um, you know, are not um, a, a, to the extent where they have difficulty in many other aspects of it. So they don't interfere with their everyday life movement difficulties and problems with the sense of smells have also been linked to um, MCI. Older people with MCI are at greater risk of developing Alzheimer's, but not all of them uh, do so. So some may even revert to normal cognitive function and you know, with good exercise, healthy eating, and also um, good really oxygenation of the brain, the good cardiac health of these people as well. So I will burst the, really the myth that, you know, the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's, the first symptoms of Alzheimer's, they are, you know, they vary from person to person. For many, uh, they, do, you know, decline the memory aspect of cognition, uh, such as, you know, the word finding, their vision and the spatial issues are also, and then they have impaired reasoning or judgment may signal, uh, you know, the very early stages of disease um, and researchers really look at that um, and that as well um, in quite extensively. Um, so they are studying, uh, researchers are looking at the biomarkers, the biological signs of disease that are found in brain images, cerebral spinal fluid and blood. And now even in the urine, people are beginning to see the end products of really degenerative brain as it is going through degeneration. To, and they detect these changes that are seen in MCI and then the cognitive normal people, um, uh, you know, have uh, if it is fined on those, they could be at the greater risk for Alzheimer's. So we could have the biomarkers that we can predict that in 10 years, somebody is going to develop Alzheimer's. So more research is now needed before the techniques can be used broadly and routine, routinely to diagnose Alzheimer's in a healthcare provider's office. So we are not really quite there yet, um, but things are really getting better with these biomarkers. So when you look at the mild cases of Alzheimer disease, you know, um, uh, as, it, as it, the disease worsens, people will experience greater memory loss and other cognitive difficulties. Problems can include, you know, wandering. We often see people will just wander off if you have the loved one. And unfortunately, you know, my mother passed away two years ago and she was also suffering from dementia as well. And you could see all of the, you know, people withering away, a beautiful brain that was once uh, you know, fantastic, just really start to slowly, uh, it's just like the lights are going off. And they will have you know, uh, even handling simple things like paying bills and, and the personality and behavior also changes. They will through tizzy, tantrum, they will be abusive, they will be aggressive, and they will all of a sudden have no idea what's really going on. So this could still be the mild case of Alzheimer's, but at the Alzheimer's moderate level, you know, people begin to have now hallucination, delusion, and paranoia. It gets coupled in with all the other, uh, other conditions. And then when you reach the you know, severe cases, ultimately, these plaques and tangles, they spread throughout the brain. The brain shrinks incredibly. People with severe Alzheimer's, they cannot communicate and are completely dependent on others for care. So this is really the near the end of life. The person may be in bed most of all, all of the time and the body systems begin to shut down completely. Now, let me show you a, really a video that will, um, was prepared by NIH. And this video will summarize everything that I have told you so far. And then I will shift gear into our own research as to what we think could be the paradigm shift in this particular disease.
In healthy people, all sensations, movements, thoughts, memories, and feelings are the result of signals that pass through billions of nerve cells or neurons in the brain. Neurons constantly communicate with each other through electrical charges that travel down axons, causing the release of chemicals across tiny gaps to neighboring neurons. Other cells in the brain, such as astrocytes and microglia, clear away debris and help keep neurons healthy. In a person with Alzheimer's disease, the most basic form of dementia, toxic changes in the brain destroy this healthy balance. These changes may occur years, even decades, before the first signs of dementia. Researchers believe that this process involves two proteins called beta amyloid and tau, which somehow become toxic to the brain. It appears that abnormal tau accumulates, eventually forming tangles inside neurons. And beta amyloid clumps into plaques, which slowly build up between neurons. As the level of amyloid reaches a tipping point, there is a rapid spread of tau throughout the brain. But tau and beta amyloid may not be the only factors involved in Alzheimer's. Other changes that affect the brain may also play a role over time. The vascular system may fail to deliver sufficient blood and nutrients to the brain. The brain may lack the glucose needed to power its activity. Chronic inflammation sets in as microglial cells fail to clear away debris and astrocytes react to distressed microglia. Eventually, neurons lose their ability to communicate. As neurons die, the brain shrinks, beginning in the hippocampus, a part of the brain important to learning and memory. People may begin to experience memory loss, impaired decision-making, and language problems. As more neurons die throughout the brain, a person with Alzheimer's gradually loses the ability to think, remember, make decisions, and function independently. Achieving a deeper understanding of the molecular and cellular mechanisms and how they may interact is vital to the development of effective therapies. Much progress has been made in identifying various. So um, I think it's also important to, um, to remember that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that the amyloid precursor protein is cleaved by gamma and the beta and, uh, you know, enzyme, the secretase enzymes, and, and they're releasing be um, beta peptide, which accumulates to form uh, really these amyloid plaques. And then you could see these plaques forming in the brain. And then what we, the changes one sees is that, you know, when you look at a healthy brain, you have the, you know, the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus and both sides, they are really very healthy and the neurons are very happy campers as if they just gotten their salary today. And then when you think about the Alzheimer brain, both of these regions take really huge hits. And then you get these ventricles because the cells are dying and the ventricles get enlarged. You have shrinkage of both the cerebral cortex as well as the hippocampus also shrinks. And then you create big gaps. These fibrillary entanglement the entangles form around the soma and the dendrites, whereas these um, A-beta plaques, uh, you know, the tau protein accumulates at the synaptic terminal. So if you look at the actual um, you know, MRI images of the brain, you will also find that, you know, the brain is almost, uh, many major areas of the brain are gone. And then the major shrinkage occurs as shown earlier, that both the, these ventricles really get large and the hippocampus shrink and also your cerebral cortex shrink quite significantly. So these are dramatic changes that occur, but you know, this is what uh, people think, or we are understanding of the potential causes. It could be the age, you know, and the gender, but we have come to now realization that even younger people could, you know, five to, to, 
to 8% of people could actually have Alzheimer's, but they never get diagnosed or they get never really get proper treatment done. So the signs can start earlier as, as early as 40 years. Then you have head injuries, concussion, you know, sports related and injuries cardiovascular diseases, not enough blood going or glucose going. Then the lifestyle changes. You have, you know, um, diabetes, Alzheimer's, your obesity and mother and the environmental factors it could be toxins in the environment. And then there are, you know, infections. Sometimes the inflammation of the brain or the brain tissue can activate these astroglial cells, which could then go and start damaging the brain cells and not do their job. Then you have genetic factors and that also and people believe there is a large genetic component to it. The one thing that this particular video most people don't talk about is actually the neurotransmitter or the cholinergic hypothesis. Most of people have really focused on beta amyloid. Billions of dollars have been spent on tau and breaking down those proteins and the enzymes, but to no avail. Each and every single clinical trial has actually failed. And this is just maybe that we are barking in the wrong tree and the, that these plaques and also the tau proteins are maybe, maybe the, not the cause, but causal because as a result of other aspects, the brain cells are not healthy, the lack of trophic factors, um, you know, will then um, uh, perturb neuronal communication when neurons are not communicating um, and the activity is not there. Other um, you know, um, uh, elements could take, uh, take hold uh, of these things. So there, um, you know, the cholinergic hypothesis has already been there, but we serendipitously bumped into it. We were looking at cholinergic neurons and the synaptic transmission between them. And we realized that these cholinergic pathway or cholinergic neurons, um, a synaptic transmission was really seriously compromised in instances where we use uh, really, um, uh, you know, these neurons where that we use them and we were studying, I don't know why it keeps flipping. Um, um, when we were looking at these uh, neurons, we uh, came to realization that neurons that had formed synapses, um, cholinergic synapses, there was uh, a particular gene that was upregulated um, in those cells. And cells that failed to form synapses, cholinergic synapses, that particular gene was downregulated. And when we sequenced that gene, it turned out to be um, what we call a MEN1 or a tumor suppressor gene. Um, and that was a really a surprising find that we also didn't pay much attention to in the beginning because this is MEN1 is a tumor suppressor gene um, that has been identified for endocrine tumors, but it is expressed throughout brain. And when we knocked out the animals with menin, it's a lethal mutation, the animals die. But when you look at um, these mice models or in rats, we find that it is only confined to hippocampus area. The men one expression is in that area. So that led us further to explore this gene. And we thought maybe this is the gene that is playing really important role in regulating acetylcholine receptor function in, in, in the animal. So when we looked at, you know, it's a endocrine neuroplasia type one tumor. This is an autosomal dominant familiar cancer syndrome, which is characterized by endocrine tumors. Menin is a nuclear protein, and that's what they found in tumors and cancer, but it is a transcri transcriptional regulator. It mediates both gene activation and repression. But, you know, again, this is what I said, that the key may not be under the lamppost, but somewhere else. And that's really got us very excited and interested as to what this gene is really doing in the hippocampus area and what could be its physiological function. So to cut the long story short, what we have really demonstrated is that in the presence of trophic factors, neurons exhibit an activity pattern whereby their activity changes from tonic um, activity to a bursting pattern. And whenever trophic molecule, for example, epidermal growth factor, when it binds to its own epidermal growth factor receptor, it will open up voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium comes in and then calcium interacts either directly to activate MEN1 gene 
or indirectly it is cleaved by calpin enzyme and when it's cleaved it goes into two components and this was a major discovery from our lab and these papers were published in nature family journals where we actually demonstrated that calcium um, you know cleaves calpin enzyme which activate calpin enzyme which in turn will cleave menin into menin is a protein that is encoded by men1 gene into c menin and n menin n menin is translocated to nucleus where it upregulates the transcription of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor gene, whereas the C menin now causes the clustering of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors at the nerve terminal. So this was really an interesting find. And we wanted to really determine and ask the question whether menin also plays an important role in the human brain uh, so for uh, in, in learning and memory. And that was an interesting aspect of research where we asked the question whether C menin or the menin of protein encoded by men1 gene is cleaved by, um, you know, and, and is uh, translocated into two different components. So when we look at N menin, which is a nuclear a component of menin protein is located to the cell body only. And this is the DAPI that shows the two neurons. And when you look at C menin, C menin is distributed all along the, um, in the extrasomal compartments, axons and dendrites, as well as in the cytoplasm and the perinuclear area as well. And when you do the, the actual combined images, you find that the N menin is localized to the nucleus, whereas C menin is, is also distributed all across these boutons, these terminals. And this particular then C menin plays an important role in clustering nicotinic acetylcholine receptors at the nerve terminal. And remember, I told you that in the hippocampus, these cholinergic pathways are really essential for many kinds of learning and memory. We then um, went on to look at C menin. Um, it does it really cluster at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and co-localizes with them. And, and of course, when we label it with bunglotoxin, which specifically labels alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, we find that both synaptophysin, which is the pre or synaptotagamin, which is the presynaptic protein, also co and, the, and then um, BTX, which is the bunglotoxin in the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, they really co-localize um, with, with c -manin. So this really gave us the idea that c menin is playing a very important role in targeting nicotinic acetylcholine receptors at the synaptic terminals where the cholinergic function is really um, playing an important role. And then we looked at also, uh, you know, does synaptic c menin it clusters nicotinic acetylcholine receptors? We, we use the knockout um, in using the shRNA. And if we use the non-controlled target um, for shRNA, um, what we really find is that we, um, we have uh, almost the pre-nicotine uh, related ionic currents are there when we apply nicotine um, using a perfusion system at the synaptic terminal. What we find is that the frequency of these minis increase and but when we knock it out um, in cultured neurons, we see that frequency actually disappears. And so you only have these larger events, but the frequency is much lower as compared to the non-controlled target SHRNA. So when you selectively knock out menin, you also knock out these nicotinic acetylcholine receptor activated um, gated channels as well. So to cut the long story short, we have since done a really a whole series of experiments to demonstrate what I showed you earlier, that trophic molecules, when they act on their receptors, they will increase neuronal activity. And remember this activity declines in Alzheimer's disease and the neuronal activity when it, it, it increases, it allows the calcium to come in. Calcium will now act, uh, will activate calpain enzyme. And this calpain enzyme then cleaves menin into C menin and also into N menin. And what happens in that case is that you get 
targeting of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Um, and so this was really an exciting finding, but, but menin has never been shown in the human brain. So we went on to uh, get the tissue from human uh, autopsied brain. Um, and you know, the human tissue is really a pain to work with because of the autofluorescence. So we had to optimize the antibodies and, and using instead of fluorescent antibody, we used uh, you know, a different approach to be able to label these neurons. We wanted to make sure that the integrity of the tissue is maintained. We got the hippocampus from both control age mat human um, tissue, as well as from Alzheimer's patients uh, whose brains were um, autopsied. And we then used the actual neurofilament to show that the integrity of the tissue is maintained. We also went on to then look at other synaptic protein, for example, postsynaptic density protein, and we find it beautifully labels these neurons in both cortex as well as in the hippocampus. And you can see that this labeling is really phenomenal. You see that the protein, which is the postsynaptic density protein, not only present in the soma, but also in the axon and extrasomal compartment. So this would be on the postsynaptic site. We then wanted to see the piece presynaptic site. And what we did was that we stained those tissue with synaptophysin. And it's also really intriguing to see that this particular presynaptic protein is not present in the cell body, but rather it is distributed throughout the, the tissue and in the extrasomal compartment, which is in the axon and in the dendrites of the cells. And then we asked the question, but well, can we then also find nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in human tissue using alpha bongrotoxin we labeled, and we found that these receptors also cluster um, in larger, uh, larger numbers and, and in the way that the receptors cluster at the neuromuscular junction. Um, so the final um, aspect of our experiment was to demonstrate c -menin. So when we looked at the c -menin, remember this is the fragment that is localized in the cytoplasm as well as in the axon. And we got really very exciting labeling in the cortex as well as in the hippocampus. And you can see that not all neurons are labeled with, with menin, a c -menin, but a large population of neuron in the hippocampus, this is where learning and memory occurs, are, um, are also labeled, um, labeled with this particular protein. So the next question was that, you know, can we visualize now menin and tau expression in normal aging brain? And it's really interesting that when we looked at the normal brain and we were surprised to find that there are tau um, actually present in even in the hippocampus area and in a normal aging brain as well. So it's not that these proteins are only hallmark of Alzheimer's. Many normal brains of people live healthy life, they die, but they will, they will have tau proteins or tau tangles in their brain as well. And you can see certain specific neurons are actually also completely destroyed by tau. And this brown labeling is the C-manon, which specifically labeling and sparing most of these neurons. When we look at the actual, similarly, in, in a normal aging brain, you also see these tau uh, kind of fragments all over the, these um, um, uh, clusters uh, all over the place in different parts of the brain, even though it was a normal healthy brain. But when we looked at the actual in AD in human brain, we find that both tau is excessively expressed in different parts of the brain. And also when we label the brown label is c -menin and the red or the pink is, um, is uh, tau protein. And we often see that the c menin containing neurons are really surrounded and completely or completely destroyed by tau protein. So this is really an, an important indication um, um, of you know, what might be happening in, even in the Alzheimer's disease whereby we think that these cholinergic neurons are specifically either targeted by tau protein or other proteins in the brain area. And this may be really the underlying factor in terms of Alzheimer's disease. And so we have many of these brains now that we have really prepared, but of course, and we are now moving forward 
in terms of molecular characterization using Western blot and then the PCR and the qPCR to be able to demonstrate differential expression levels of semen and, and how do they corroborate with the disease condition in Alzheimer's. But of course, you know, you cannot really do these kinds of experiments in the um, in humans. And so this is my last slide. I think I'm running late as well. So when you look at the actual, uh, um, you know, we, we uh, prepared a manual knockout, which is a conditional knockout. As I told you earlier, the men in knockout is lethal. So we um, make a conditional knockout. We allow these pups to get to two, three months, four months, um, and, and with chem, uh, chem kinase to a Cree um, or Chad Cree. And then we do is that we activate that genes when they get a little bit older. And what we do is we specifically using stereotactic injections, we inject um, you know, um, um, the Cree virus right in the hippocampus area where we can selectively knock out um, this particular um, gene. We wait for the expression. And what we really find is uh, it's quite remarkable that we can selectively um, really uh, uh, express uh, these particular, um, uh, you know, um, our virus uh, into those neurons, specifically in the hippocampal neurons. And if you knock those out, what we find is that if you knock down menin, menin expression is significantly down. And then also alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are also knocked down. And when we do the behavioral analysis on these animals, we find that these animals exhibit quite serious learning and memory and cognitive deficits. So what we think really is that this particular gene um, may be playing in an important role in, in Alzheimer's disease. This is a narrat narrative, that a paradigm shift that we are uh, pushing um, forward. And then the idea is that if we can knock this gene out, we will, ex we will be able to see really a phenotype in these animals that will exhibit cognitive dysfunction and learning and memory. And I was just told the other day that the experiments are really uh, beautifully working. And these animals where we knocked out, you know, stereotactically, uh, conditional knockout of menin, men one gene or menin, these animals exhibit learning and memory deficit. So this lends really a behavioral, um, you know, support uh, to our correlation and, and our hypothesis that MEN1 gene plays an important role in learning and memory in the hippocampus area. And then the perturbation of this particular gene will render the brain dysfunctional um, and may produce a phenotype that is um, just like um, your Alzheimer's disease. So I will stop uh, talking here and be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Let me uh, narrate you first. But if anyone from the in-house here in Zoom can unmute themselves and ask a question. Most welcome. OK. So, uh, sir, the first question is, uh, is there any criteria to measure the cognitive ability or the level of Alzheimer's in patients? The first question is this. Um, so, you know, there are um, some, it's, it's often time in young people, we miss really the diagnosis because we think that maybe they're tired, maybe there's some other reason, maybe sometimes these are the episodic loss of you know, memory functions. But in, in the elderly, the important thing to remember is that if you are testing a patient for the first time or second time for memory, you will be amazed that these people will perform exactly the same as their control cohort non-AD uh, patients would do because there is a lot of cognitive reserve in their brain and that cognitive reserve allows them to be able to perform well. But if you repeat these kind of testing, second or third time, they just fall apart. They really go you know, um, out of the scale. So the you know, important tests that you would do is simple cognitive learning and memory tests, simple tasks, 
you know, you give them, uh, there are many, many uh, simple memory tests, um, both sh for the short term, and then you can also do a long term. But most of the time, you know, um, these patients could easily falter and you will know and that the early stages of Alzheimer's where their cognitive function is impaired. So there are really tests to be able to do it. And you could also, um, you know, um, have them do certain motor skills and certain language skills. And the language part is also um, sometimes a, a, a great indicator, but it really depends on the stage of the disease. Thank you, sir. Sir, there is one more question that is it a possibility to detect the possible onset of Alzheimer's by using CHIP, which is uh, one of your uh, specific area? Is there any progress or something in future? So, um, you know, um, I promised myself I wouldn't talk about CHIP, but since it seems like you guys like the CHIP, um, you know, the first um, chip that we developed, and that was the very first experiment. We asked the question whether learning and memory could be recapitulated on chip, and then the short-term potentiation and the long-term potentiation. And you know, when we did this experiments, and then I had two Nobel laureates looking over my shoulder, and then also Peter Formherz at the Max Planck Institute where we were doing these experiments. And Germans normally don't get very excited but he was so excited that he just jumped off his chair and he started to work in the parking lot. And he says, I never thought I will live long enough to see, how did you really do this? So the idea really was that the learning and memory could be recapitulated using a really the chip. But can we get deeper into the hippocampus area where you could implant these chips and maybe replace the memories we are not really quite there because to get there, you have to go deep into the brain and you don't want to damage the normal tissue, um, which is really uh, you know, performing other functions in other vital areas. So, but I think a time will come whereby you will be able to recapitulate memory and, and it may be implant memories in people's brain if you could gain access to, you know, in these patients, often the hippocampus is completely destroyed. You look at the major parts of the cortex are also gone. Brain shrinks quite significantly. And if there is no hope and if people are willing to volunteer, I will be happy to put a few chips. And then all of your students will come and say, sir, I need one as well. But you know, remind them that this is not for, for exams. Um, it is only for those people who are really debilitated because of the disease. Yes, sir. They will be happy to do that because I think the forgetfulness and the memory problems are much more common now. And maybe this is accelerating the progress of these diseases. Yeah, well, I think that you have a really good point. But, you know, the reason for our lack of memory and cognitive function is not that we are losing our brain's capacity. What we are doing is that we are actually having our memories highway hijacked or intercepted or interrupted. So, you know, uh, I give you an example that you have a young first year student, he falls in love, you know, with a, another first year, you know, classmates and they go out on a date and then all of a sudden he wants to impress her, but the kids in the background are making a lot of noise. So all of a sudden his brain is distracted. And then another good looking couple sitting in front of him is talking to waiter. And this person is now saying, oh, ye kya order kar rahe? And I, I wanna find out what it is that they're really ordering, what they're eating. So your brain is constantly interfered with. Your memory is interfered with. People put on the songs and, and music, they think it helps them learn, but that thing is actually interfering the highway of communication between brain cells. And you're studying in Pakistan, you know, drama is on and then news is on and then this is happening, this is happening and then and Sabzi Wala Bahar and then, you know, Bindi Wala and all of these people are selling vegetables on the road. Your brain goes out there and all of a sudden your memory highway is disrupted. So it's not that the people, you know, so there's a couple of reasons. The biological intelligence is being hijacked by technical intelligence. We are not using our brain the way we used it in the past. And we help, you know, get, get help from technical aspect. 
we would go to the library, we spend time in the library, maps, we will check the map. Now you just say, Google, find this place for me. Google, find a restaurant for me. Google, do this. So the technical component is really compromising our biological intelligence quite significantly. So that's another uh, really, uh, you know, the factor that is affecting our, our memory uh, consolidation and memory formation. And also I think the ratification process that you have is just pure memorization in our country is meant to pass an exam and not to acquire knowledge. So if you do not have a conscious part of the memory interacting together with your unconscious component, that memory has a very short term. So, you know, you're right that it is enhancing, uh, you know, cognitive dysfunction, perhaps to a certain extent, but they are, that is not because of the disease condition. It is our lifestyle that is ruining our memory and cognitive functions. Sir, we also have a question from Sandeep. Sandeep is asking that why can't nervous tissues regenerate? Is there any new research about that or is this possible? That's a great question, Sandeep. And, you know, um, I always give the examples that, you know, a peripheral nervous system can regenerate. How come what's wrong with the central nervous system? Why it cannot regenerate? The problem really there is if you have epileptic seizures, your brain cells sprout. And when they sprout, they will extend into the territory beyond their own territory. It's just like the border between two countries. The moment you step over, they will be shooting you know, at each other. So the brain doesn't allow this to happen. So during development, imagine or think about that a road is being built, right? So you flatten the road, you cut the trees, you have you know, big bulldozers comes, they throw rock on it, you flatten it, then you have charcoal, and then you put you know, charcoal on the road, you put the roller, and then the road is really done, and th that machinery is gone. So during brain development, those molecules that help guide neurons and help them connect to each other and go to different parts, they come and go once their job is done. But what happens is that the divider in between the road that divides incoming and outgoing traffic remains in the brain and remains. So because you don't want head on collision between traffic, if the traffic was on the same road going two ways and many roads in Pakistan and India are like that, you could actually have head on collisions. To prevent this, you actually separate these two roads and then you have a maiden in the middle of the road that will prevent these cars coming into each other, having head on collision. Those road barriers are inhibitory molecules like NI35, samophorin. These molecules will prevent any growth from occurring because you don't want brain cells to enter the wrong territory and then it gets it all jumbled, mumbled up. So mother nature has really uh, planned it so well, given you too many neurons that in case some of them are damaged, you have the ability to bring in other neurons to recapitulate the function or regain that lost function, or maybe step in to um, fill in the gap, but mother nature wouldn't allow you uh, to, to get these cells to regenerate. Now, Martin Schwab did some experiments pretty cool. They used the peripheral tissue and they grafted it into the central brain. And then they asked the question whether A, these neurons are capable of growing or whether the environment is not conducive to growth. So when they put the peripheral tissue graft in the brain, they could see the neurons actually crossed over and they started to grow. So the idea is that there are inhibitory molecules in our brain that prevent brain cells from regenerating. And this is also the problem when you use stem cells. Stem cells can produce neurons, but they cannot be guided to different targets because that road machinery, those molecules that created the road are no longer there. And the other thing really that is important is that when these cells produced from stem cells cannot go, they anywhere they turn into tumors and it becomes really cancer in the brain. So we cannot use stem cell therapies to repair damaged brain just because there is no innate propensity for the central nervous system of your brain to regenerate. 
Sir, for such an elaborative answer, uh, one of our participants, Rojda Froze, is asking that you have mentioned that younger people are uh, also vulnerable for Alzheimer's disease. So uh, her question is that, are the symptoms and severity alike or different? And number two, are there any researches about having Alzheimer's in younger people? So, you know, um, the evidence is really uh, growing phenomenally in terms of now with our understanding of diagnosing young people who do have Alzheimer's. And, you know, um, we looked at a couple of younger people and their, um, their doctors often said that maybe it's, you know, you have brain fog, you have, you know, COVID related depression, you have anxiety. And you have other kinds of uh, issues because even people who have schizophrenia and, and fear or, or long-term fear or post-traumatic stress, you lose a lot of your brain cells as well. And sometimes in the cognitive functions as well. So those people do not get tagged because everybody think it's a disease of you know, aging and aging population will suffer. But we have seen people as young as 40 they will exhibit the signs and symptoms when you do the MRI on their brain or do the actual, you know, um, bio essays on them, you will find that, you know, their, their brain is undergoing degenerative processes. And the brain that I showed you, one where it was a normal aging human, and it was a gentleman at the age of, I think, 45 or 48, that also exhibited tau related proteins in the brain, which shows that even my brain actually has those proteins um, that are tangling up. And it's, um, and I think, you know, sometimes when my wife tells me to do something, I, I pull that off that maybe I'm developing Alzheimer's to, to get away. But I know that my brain will probably have quite a few bunch of, you know, tau proteins and fibrillin entanglement in my brain even though I think I function, uh, you know, perfectly okay for the most part. Um, but, you know, uh, so I think it's really important when these young people are presented in a clinical setting that we do not rule out the possibility that could be an early onset Alzheimer disease. 5% of people in North America are actually young who are presented now with Alzheimer's. Thank you, sir. Sir, one uh, last question, which is about uh, the uh, cholinergic uh, pathways that uh, Farah is asking, can we strengthen the cholinergic pathway to delay the degeneration? Again, a, a really a great question. So, you know, most of the drugs that are given to uh, patients who are suffering from Alzheimer's, um, and nobody is given, uh, you know, a tau or, um, an, you know, a beta bursting drug because there is no such thing. One has just been approved clinically, but that is really uh, not going to work either. I don't know how it went through FDA approval, but most of these drugs are there. They will either, uh, you know, inactivate the enzyme that, you know, acetylcholine esterase that breaks down the acetylcholine. So what it does is that when you inactivate the enzyme, the acetylcholine stays in the terminal for much longer time. And it also binds to the receptor and activate that pathway for a longer time. So you only manage these patients, you don't really cure them or treat them. So um, I, what can you do? I think there are many ways that we think, you know, a healthy um, diet, brain exercises, you know, um, and good uh, meditation and doing some game, you know, brain games and that you can really continue to activate the memory pathway um, and that will enrich the trophic factors, which will enrich the cholinergic pathway. So I think this is one of the ways and so far the only treatment that is given now is the cholinergic uh, pathway. Uh, thank you, sir. Sir, uh, beside this Zoom meeting, we have 200 almost participants who are viewing us on the uh, YouTube channel. So we have some questions from there. Uh, one question is that in your view, what horizon up till now has been achieved pharmacologically in seizing and controlling the protein expression in Alzheimer's or dementia brain? 
Nothing. Nothing has really worked so far. You know, all the clinical trials after the, you know, phase two have utterly and completely failed. Because, you know, like I said earlier, I gave the punchline that we are barking on the wrong tree. We're looking for, if, you know, the research sometimes is strange. You have a pond and it's a peaceful pond and somebody throws a rock and a pebble and it all of a sudden, everybody will think the fish is there, right? There is something happening. Everybody dives there. Fish is not really there. It's somebody really threw an idea and then everybody went in that direction. So tau protein, similarly, you know, uh, uh, bursting those proteins, it's not going to work at, at, at all. This is my prediction because, you know, the fibrillary entanglement is not the cause, it's causal. When neurons begin to really uh, not communicate with each other, cells that, you know, fire apart, they fall apart. And once they start falling apart, many of these, um, you know, other background noise will show up and these ripples will then be created just like you throw a little pebble in the pond, it creates ripples and it goes really like, you know, a mushroom cloud all over the place. So I think it's really important for us to revisit and test every single possibility as to, you know, how we could conquer. The thing is, the people are living long lives, right? Um, and um, the longevity and good health is allowing this, this really pandemic to come and swing uh, our way. And this will become a real major problem for humanity to deal with. So it uh, currently, I don't think there is any cure because our understanding is really very, very poor about all of these neurodegenerative diseases. We are managing them, but we cannot treat them. We cannot cure them. The ultimate thing is to go back to neurodevelopment and find out what is the strategy that Mother Nature adopted to put this thing together. It's only then we will be able to understand when things go wrong, how can we actually go back and try to fix it the way it was to start with. Uh, one last question uh, from the uh, YouTube link uh, that do Alzheimer's disease stop further progression of the neuro neuro neuronal development or it just uh, cease? So, you know, the neurons begin to die and they die really at mass. Um, and it's, you know, we thought that in the hippocampus neurogenesis occurs new neurons can be born and people you know, pur purported that these neurons are preferentially recruited in learning and memory circuits. None of that has panned out for humans. In humans, there is no neurogenesis in the hippocampus. And a paper came out in Nature very recently where they looked at these young children and they looked at neurogenesis at different stages of the brain and they find actually in human neurogenesis doesn't really occur. So if you're not reproducing these neurons to replace the dying one, when the dying ones will start dying, they will really create big ventricle open spaces this is where, you know, when the, your, your glial cells and the immune cells begin to see the things are really going wrong, they start to shoot. And there is so much friendly fire and so much collateral damage that they end up killing their own brain cells and maybe wrapping them up with all these tangles in the proteins that they excrete in, a, as a result. So um, there is no natural replacement of damaged brain tissue in humans. Um, um, you know, this is one of the reasons that we really invoke synaptic plasticity and hope that the other neurons could chip in and help regain that lost brain function. Okay, sir, so uh, one of our um, teammates actually have this question. So I have to ask that, can the short-term memory loss be observed clinically as selective, that is at some time very evident and other time full-blown? So can short-term memory loss be observed clinically? Yes, I, and, and there are really, you know, uh, many important things that you could do, some many interesting tests where you test them on a short-term memory and then you distract them with something completely different task 
and then come back. You know, the human working memory or short-term memory, we had to give in um, to acquire languages. And, you know, when we were monkeys and most of us are still monkeys, you know, climbed up on the trees and we needed to get down from the tree and um, so we gave up our memory. So on my screen, I have a whole bunch of people. And if I flash the numbers um, on that screen uh, for a monkey, monkey will remember almost 50 numbers in that order in which they were flashed. It will go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it can do this. And if I tested, you know, your best to graduate students as well, they won't pass more than seven. And this is why our phone number was only up to seven digits because that's as far as we could really memorize, we could remember. And you will always see a dot after any number and then in the seven numbers because we give up our working memory to acquire languages. A monkey can beat me anytime because a monkey's working memory is extremely critical for its survival. It has to see all the other enemies on different trees. It will know one, two, three, four, five, six on that tree, that tree, that branch. It remembers it and then it will execute its you know, defense or attack. Whereas for us humans, you know, um, that we had to give up. But there are many tests that you could do, a memory test on the screen to show um, them certain things and, and then distract them. You know, you have an interference with some other aspects and then when you bring them back. But, you know, I think, you know, your colleague would know that this is a, so true for the exam period for our students. When they come after their ratification, they memorized it, you know, um, they will remember. But after exam, you know, buy them a cup of coffee or tea and ask them the same question, I can swear that they will remember, right? So it's often use dependent. It's not really time dependent, it's use dependent. If I tell you a phone number and I ask you, Sadaf, make that call, you know, at eight o'clock and call, you know, doctor this and give that message, you will remember that. But once you have made that phone call and I ask you that number at dinner, you won't remember. I'm going to test this. That's the work, short-term working memory test right there for you. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. And uh, I hope that uh, all the learners have enjoyed because we have a great feedback for the session, as always. And we'll be sharing all the uh, incoming thoughts. And if they want to share something with you, we'll be sharing that. And for those who are asking for the presentations, uh, so I will share the YouTube link so that they can hear the talk as well. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Thank you and have a wonderful meeting. And I will be you know, attending some of those sessions, but it is almost uh, 1.30 in the morning for me. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so good Thank luck. you so much for your time. Always a pleasure. Anything for you, Sadhav. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Laugh is. Laugh is. So I have an announcement for all of you that we have a lab tutorial and we have some uh, very exciting labs to show you. Uh, which you can also identify yourself and uh, some non-invasive and invasive test. And Dr. Fazan Mirza will be uh, with us. But as you can see in the program, as you can see in the program, so we have one hour uh, break. Uh, you can just flex your muscles and uh, just have some tea and coffee, which is not on us, obviously, because it is virtual. So good luck uh, for the next session. We'll be back exactly after one hour. Thank you so much.
welcome back everyone uh, now let me introduce our next speaker who will be facilitating the lab tutorial session and uh, uh, he is just here so let me introduce uh, dr fazan mirza fazan is uh, lecturer at university of karachi he is uh, he has currently completed his phd in physiology from the department of physiology university of karachi his thesis focuses on healthy aging and degenerative sciences so he will be more interested in uh, telling you about how we as a healthy being are actually inclined towards the degenerative disorders and he has secured a, a faculty position in msc and was a gold medalist in bsc honors at the university of karachi in physiology he has been indulged in teaching for a long period of time now and is currently a lecturer uh, as well as he is also visiting faculty at many places he is a keen researcher and has many publications in national and international reputed journal at this young age he has organized many scientific conferences on national and international levels fazan has de delivered many lectures on stress management mental health neurosciences and has also attended many sessions as well uh, to learn from it his uh, main interest is in psychology psychophysiology and neurosciences currently he is also pursuing a uh, certain post graduate studies uh, related to the psychophysiological aspects and behavioral neuroscience uh, welcome fazan for this session and uh, over to you thank you so much uh, dr sadar uh, for such a kind introduction uh, this is fazan mirza i hope uh, my voice is clear to you all all the participants can hear me you are audible fazan okay thank you so much miss uh first of all uh, participants i would like you to welcome i would like to welcome you all in this uh, ibro research conference which is the associate school of neuroscience that we are uh, conducting here in karachi uh, through this platform the lab tutorial that i have planned for today uh, it basically deals with various non invasive tools what i'll be doing i'll be sharing my screen with you so that we can uh, discuss these things and these tools and one on one by one we can uh, we can probably just uh, see how these tools are used in highlighting any uh, underlying neurological decline or any uh, you can say degeneration that can lead to any neurological pathology or psychopathology so uh, as uh, dr sadaf ahmed uh, mentioned uh, in the introduction as well that my research interest have always been towards healthy uh, lifestyle or healthy um, can say individuals and apparently people who think that they are healthy at times they are not healthy enough and there are certain um, you can say markers which can be used to see what kind of uh, health malady are they predisposed to although since they think that they are healthy right now so you don't really expect them to have to be having certain disease but they are on the track that if they continue uh, without any uh, you can say intervention or they can they continue their lifestyle the way they have been leading eventually they will be suffering from certain disorders and those disorders probably will come early in their life as compared to the individuals of Uh, of their own age group belonging to uh, some other category so uh, non invasive indicators of neurological decline this is my this is the main paradigm of my of my talk today and my lab tutorial as well so i hope the my screen is visible to you when we are saying non invasive indicators what do you mean by an indicator what exactly is an indicator the term indicator actually means something which can be used as a gold standard something that can be used as as a benchmark to compare against something so you have for example dementia you know dementia 
uh, is 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 basically neurological. It's because of neurological decline because uh, the person is then having some uh, reduced uh, capability of uh, learning and recalling what they have learned, reduced memory. So that is an indicator of a pathological condition. So when we are discussing indicators of neurological decline in psychopathology, my interest for you right now is non-invasive indicators. We are not going in any blood testing. We are not going for any invasive procedure. Invasive procedure basically means that we are not going into the body. We are not taking any blood sample or a CSF fluid sample or any kind of, um, you can say, recordings in which we will be placing electrodes inside the body. Nothing like that. We will be just using certain tools. And uh, these tools I have used in my researches as well. Uh, and uh, uh, I've seen that uh, the, these are these are very well uh, accepted tools, and I would like to introduce these to you one after the other, and probably we can just uh, discuss these out. So, first of all, uh, discussing the uh, discussing the paradigm of what our neural nervous system is doing. You know that your nervous system is controlling, it's coordinating on how we respond to a given situation. For example, if you are right now uh, taking this lab tutorial, your body is responding because your nervous system is sending certain signals. And the stimulus that you are receiving right now is the visual stimulus, which is going through your eyes, which is the screen of your either the laptop or any gadget that you are using right now. That's one stimulus going through your eyes to the brain. And the other stimulus is the auditory stimulus, the, the one that, that's going through your, um, uh, for example, iPods or whatever you are using as your hands-free or any device with, 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 with which you can actually hear what I'm saying. So this is, this is the, uh, these are the stimuli that the brain is receiving. Now, how do you respond to this? For example, if I'm saying something and, you, and it creates an imagery in your brain, or you try to visualize those things. For example, when I mentioned invasive, so, and I said that we are not going into and penetrating into the body, probably you got certain idea of what, what uh, I'm talking about. So that's your brain, your nervous system coordinating to the stimulus that I provided. Then a person who's suffering from any kind of neurological decline, it might be in a very initial phase. It can be in a, it, it might not be very, uh, you may say uh, something which is very advanced. Obviously, when it's very advanced, it would already be diagnosed by then in most cases. Uh, but we are talking about certain abnormalities which are in the very initial part. We are which have not yet set in to be called as a disorder. These disorders could be related to age, for example, decline that comes because of the degenerating synapses or reduced ability to produce the neurotransmitters or probably because of the, um, of the lack of, uh, you can say, coordination between the neurons. The crosstalk is, is actually not as good as it used to be. Either there is some kind of injury to the brain or to the tissue which, is, uh, or which the brain is coordinating with. Or there might be certain enlargements in the ventricles because when the ventricles in the brain enlarge, uh, this leads to you know Alzheimer's and uh, it, it can be seen in various diseases. And yes, neurotransmitter receptors, something that how a neuron talks to another neuron through the neurotransmitter. The presynaptic neuron releases the neurotransmitter substance into the synaptic cleft, and across the synaptic cleft, you have the receptors to which the neurotransmitter will then attach. So when we are screening any subject using these non-invasive tools, uh, they actually are highlighting a kind of, you can say, um, slight damage or slight alteration in the function of certain part of the brain. For example, the frontal lobe or the temporal lobe, the right hemisphere damage or the posterior parietal cortex is involved in certain pathways, olfactory cortex, motor cortex cingulated cortex, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. These are the parts which we can very well uh, address using these non-invasive tools. When we come to disorders, which are diagnosed disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, dementia, even muscle frailty, all these can, else can, can also be, uh, you can say, assessed with these tools. So uh, this setting that we are about to come, uh, what are basic, what my basic uh, interest has been, as I already told you, uh, to, to highlight the 
vulnerable age groups to highlight the vulnerable categories in our population or in your population wherever you are residing using these non invasive tool to find out uh, which individuals in in our society or in our age category or people who, who we think are healthy and if they think they are healthy enough and they are very well functional but they are vulnerable individuals they are more vulnerable to certain damages as compared to others who are more resilient so once these people have been highlighted when you have highlighted a certain group of individuals from the population you can actually suggest uh, some kind of intervention or some kind of changes in the lifestyle or some kind of whatever uh, therapies uh, which can assist a person so that the the decline or the degeneration or whatever the issue is it can be it can be slowed down it can be slowed down and the person one once the person knows that okay i have this issue the person will be in the in, in the in the you can say capacity or in the position to in trying to solve that as well so uh with this i would like to uh, start our first activity and these are uh, i think uh, quite interesting activities that i have lined up um and just i just want to have a look on the how many participants we have so we have about 23 participants right now and uh, okay so um and obviously when we are doing this activity uh, these activities i would i would want participation from the participants so for example if you are doing a certain activity and uh, i would i would like you to uh, uh, give me some response either on the chat window you can probably just uh, type it there or you can probably just uh, turn on your cameras and you can probably uh, come on screen as well uh, if you want and otherwise just uh, turn on your mic and then respond but i want participation because when we have uh, we have participation we actually can uh, interact and we can uh, delve into a certain tool more uh, in uh, in a more interesting way. so first activity here is a stroop effect now what is a stroop effect stroop effect basically was introduced uh, by j ridley stroop and uh, this this test is having or this activity is having three parts there are three steps that we will be doing the first step is control in which the time taken to read out the words given in black ink is used and this is used as a control so whatever is mentioned you will uh, whatever whatever word is mentioned in black ink you will just read it as it is for example if green the word green is written in in black ink you will just read it green you won't read it black because the word is green so you will just read the word all the words listed on that page you will read them and you will calculate the time taken for reading all those words the time taken to read all the words that will give you the time control how long you took so for this activity you will have to turn on some timer in your smartphones i think you can do that or probably i think smartphone uh, stopwatch is good enough uh, for this purpose if you go for a wristwatch or a, or a, or a wall clock it would not give you a very uh, elaborate uh, time this is the first part of the test that you read a word as it is the second part the second part comes as congruent what is congruent congruent means you will be, now we will take out the time taken to read out the same list of words but these are printed in the congruent colors what do you mean by congruent colors congruent color means for example if it's green it is written in green ink so you will read green as green you will read red as red you will read blue as blue whatever the word of that color is the ink will be same as well so now you will take out you will you will just time your performance for how long you take or how long you took to read out the words in that particular same color and same word this is congruent second part then comes the third part the third part is incongruent colors in incongruent colors what do we do we use a an incongruent ink for a word for example the word green will be written in blue ink so when you read when you when you see the word green written in blue ink you don't read green you read blue 
your brain your one part of the brain will uh, will push you to read the word the other part of the brain will push you to read the ink so what you have to do you have to read the ink in the in kong and again you have to calculate you just wrote down the time so there are three times that you need to calculate number one the time for control where every word is read in black ink the way it is mentioned number two congruent where the same color is same color ink is used for the for that particular word second time and the third time is time incongruent in which is in, in which a different ink is used for F, uh, for a certain word and you have to speak out the ink and not the word we'll calculate we'll use these two equations stroop facilitation and stroop interference once we have the time congruent from the second active from the second part of the activity and we have the time control from the first part of the activity we will subtract the two times so when we subtract these two times we will get the time of stroop facilitation how much facilitation was there by going through the list in black and then in the same colors as the words then we will calculate a stroop interference stroop interference means the time incongruent is the third part of the activity subtracted from the time control which was the first part of the activity so why are we doing stroop interference because when we are when we actually perform stroop interference uh, stroop interference actually your brain it takes longer for the brain to process the ink in which the word is printed in when you will be doing this activity you will see, you will realize yourself that it it is a bit you have to make a conscious effort to speak out the ink and not the word and the time difference between first and third is called as a stroop effect and uh, uh, the, the educated mind uh, since uh, most of us are have received basic education so the educated mind pushes you to read the words the word for example if it's green you will you would want to read it green if it's blue you read want to read it blue your brain will push you to read the word because you have been educated to read the word what you have to do you have to stop reading the word and pronounce the ink cingulated cortex and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex are the parts of the brain in which the processing occurs for the stroop effect so when we are uh, uh using this is stroop interference or when we are using stroop test these are the parts of the brain that we are focusing cingulated cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex a very interesting fact that the right cerebral hemisphere the right side of the brain uh it reads the color whereas the left one it it pushes you to read the so uh at times people are more right Uh, right cerebral hemisphere dominant or left cerebral hemisphere dominant so they are better either at stroop facilitation or at stroop interference so i hope you are uh, with me what we'll be doing this is the control i am i'm i'll just uh, uh, push this screen um in front of you i'll focus this entire list in one go and uh, i'll i'll give you a we will we'll just start timing our uh, performance and i want all the participants to uh, to kindly uh, have a stopwatch ready for example your smartphone just just use the use the stop clock from here and i start start timing your performance and with that we'll come to the this is the control list. so i think i can give you a minute or so before we um, we started in the meanwhile just align your align your uh, stopwatches so that you can turn it on and you can just calculate that you can you can just note down the time taken to read out the entire list in the country okay uh, again as i mentioned you can use the chat window to communicate with me what time you were able to uh, record for control 
I think we should start by the count of three. I want you to start one, two, three. You can start. Razan Asya Azal uh, sent the response. Uh, you can see in the chat we are writing. Okay, Miss. Yes, Miss. I can. Uh, I can see this. I can see. This. Okay. Good enough. We are getting some responses. Mine was 22.64. I'm getting 23 seconds. So, so mine was 23 seconds. That's good enough. Uh, Fiza, uh, Dr. Deepak, Fiza, uh, Titan, Priya uh, Darshani, and uh, Devish Kumar, uh -huh. Asya. Good enough. I'll just uh, can wait a minute or so so that um, others can respond as well. Good. Very good, very good. I'm getting very good responses here. Glad to see the responses from you guys. Keep the uh, whatever time you are getting, keep noted somewhere because when we will go to congruent and when, we, when you will go to incongruent. We will uh, we will apply the formulas of facilitation and scoop interference to calculate our values. So you should have a paper pen with you or a paper pencil with you, so you can just uh, jot your values per scoop, and you should know about your your brain as well. So how well you are, and, uh, how much right uh, cerebral hemisphere dominant or are you, and how much left cerebral hemisphere dominant. So I think uh, I think most of you have responded by now. I think yes. Uh, uh, very good. So what we'll do, I'll move on from control to the next part, which is congruent. So taking you back, what are we to do in congruent? This is what we are supposed to do in congruent. You will take out the time to read out the same list of printed in congruent colored, same coloring as the word. Green, written in green is red as green. So let me just display. I'll count till three on the count of three. You start. So one, two, three.
वेरी गुड ओके ओके Practicing can affect the results slightly, but not significantly, because every time the list will be different, every time the the sequence of the colors can be different. So, slight difference can be seen, or you can say you can your your performance can be improved slightly from one uh one you can say set to the other, but a uh, lot of practice, and I don't think that's going to have a significant effect on uh congruent. But yes, some effect can be seen. So I think um, I have received this uh, these uh, the times calculated time of from most of you, and the general trend. I think if you can just scroll through the through the chat window, you can also see that most of you have uh, taken less time in reading congruent as compared to control. So this is exactly this is exactly facilitation. This is what facilitation is. That reading through the control facilitated you. So the next list that you read in congruent colors, where the color is mentioned in the same ink, so that was much easier for you. Now, keeping this in mind, what we'll do? We'll go to the third part of the test, where we take the incongruent colors, and incongruent colors means that we use a different colored ink for the word. So the subject is these are the color of the ink and not the word. So, Green mentioned in blue will be as as blue, not as green. So this is where the incongruence comes. Again, I will uh, count till three, and on the count of third, you start timing your performance. So it's one, it's two, and then three. Minus one minute six seconds. How can this be so different? I hope uh, you got my point of what you are supposed to do. Let me just uh, restate that what you are supposed to do in incongruent. The first word is black. The second is blue. You don't read that as black and blue. You read the first one as orange because the ink is orange. You read the second word as red because the ink is red. You read the third word as yellow because the ink is yellow. You read the fourth word as blue because the ink is blue. The fifth one is black. So don't read out the word. Read out the ink. Those of you who um, probably were mistaken, kindly just reattempt. Because incongruent means you have to speak out the ink. You have to speak out the ink. For example, this one, which I'm highlighting, purple. You don't read it purple. You read it black. This is black. Why black? Because the ink is black. So go through the list again. 
and time your performance. Most of you, I think, will have to do it again. So you can see the difference now. The results are still coming in. Good. No issue, Rujda. I'll just display the first and the second part again. Let others just complete incongruent ones first. I'll just uh, re -re just uh, uh, I'll just put that back on screen so you can take out the times for control and control. Ayaz, I'm not sure. Uh, can you just repeat what you want? What you were saying? Repeat the first and second part with detail. Or doing, sir? Okay. Okay. I'll do. That. Okay. So what I'm doing, I'll just display this again. So coming back to the first part,
in control what we're supposed to do in control we were just supposed to go through the go through this entire list for example you will just you will start a timer and you will read the sent the words as it is for example let me read the first two lines for you i'll just start the timer and start i'll start reading black blue green purple red orange yellow black red yellow so i'll just go in the sequence the one by one 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 word one word after the other and so on so forth. and i'll take out the time to speak out all these words one after the other the word in the same ink nothing there nothing no no difficulty there. if you want you can just reattempt this as well i'll display in the second one you were supposed to this was congruent in congruent you were supposed to speak out the color in the same word as it is mentioned for example the first word first word is black the second is blue the third is green there is no there is no change here for example the word black is written in black ink the word blue is written in blue ink the word green is written in green ink the word purple is written in purple ink the red the word red is written in red ink so you read out the words black blue green purple red orange yellow black red yellow and so on and so forth and you take out the time congruent then the third incongruent what was incongruent incongruent is you have a word but the ink is different for example the first word black it's not written in black it is written with orange ink the second word blue it is not written in blue ink it is red it is written in red ink so you read the first as orange this is red as orange this is red as red this one is yellow this one as blue this one is black so this is what incongruent is coming back to the protocol this was our protocol you can just uh, go through the first three sentences that i i highlighted initially let me just uh, magnify this slightly so that you can work on what you were supposed to do what i'm doing now i'll just display the first part control if you want to redo it i'm giving you 2 minutes for this re attempt if you want okay coming to congruent yes control will take very quick congruent will take even less time should sure. not necessarily though
and then lastly in Konkan. Okay, there is one question from uh, from some YouTube uh, uh, stuff. As with astigmatism, obviously with that you can't use uh, the same protocol. But the thing is that if in that case the words get blurred, so the timer can be stopped, and once the subject can focus once again, the timer can be resumed. But although this, as I already mentioned, that this is just a screening tool. A screening tool doesn't mean that it is uh, the the outcomes. Uh, can be uh, you can say that obviously it's it's not going to be as absolute as another invasive indicator. And in case of a diagnosis illness, other tests can be deployed where the for, where a person will uh, be able to get a better outcome. Okay. The results again, as I would just say, the results in the control are 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 uh, you are getting you take you take less time in pronouncing those words in control. In congruent, most of these subjects they take even less time, or or almost the same time, like a plus minus of a few seconds. But in incongruent. In uncongruent, there will be a vast difference. There will be a significant difference to see from the from the uh, the quantity of the time, because this is a stroop interference, and this is exactly what stroop effect is. Now, since you have your recordings by now, what we'll do we calculate our values for stroop facilitation and stroop interference. With repetition, Rajda, the, uh, the uh, this can this can improve. With repetition, this can improve. But although uh, the improvement that you have shown is a is, is a good improvement, slightly it can get improved. So you can just calculate your stroop facilitation and stroop interference. Time congruent minus time control and time incongruent minus time control. This is what we are interested in. Stroop interference. Here we go. Okay, I asked you took same time on both. Good enough. In twenty five in the second, minus two and forty. You can see the trend. You can see the trend on the chat window that um, uh, almost every one of you um, took longer in the stroop interference. But again, the difference is still within the seconds. The, the difference between the, the stroop interference, the, it's not in it's it's not in minutes. It's still in this, in seconds only. But yes, it varies from one individual to another. You don't have to calculate anything. Then you just uh, you just uh, in uh, just uh, substitute the times here, and you just work out your um, values. So what exactly happened here? What exactly happened? Here? As I already mentioned while I was highlighting this thing, that uh, the educated mind. Since we all are educated people, so the educated mind insisted on reading the recognizing, uh, reading the word, the word, whatever the word, rather than the ink. 
so when you are doing incongruent so why why incongruent was so difficult why incongruent took more uh, you can say of your time because the this word for example the one that i am with my lighting this one this one is 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 to be pronounced as green is not pronounced not to be pronounced as green it is pronounced to be pronounced as blue because the ink is blue so the educated mind pushes you to read the word green and then purple and then yellow and then blue no you are not supposed to do that because the, you have to you have to interfere with the processing um uh faiza can you just check your internet connection I, uh, is my voice breaking for everyone because the internet connectivity issue can be at, can be at both ends mine or probably yours yes fazan you are audible but uh, sometime you are uh... okay okay probably i'll just uh, shut the so if you were uh, if you were to point out whether your uh, you are more right cerebral hemisphere dominant person or you are more left cerebral hemisphere dominant person so what does the stupid interference tell you about your own uh, brain where do you stand was it easy for you to uh, did, did you take less time in incongruent no i think there was no one here who took less time in reading in congruent i think we all took more time in reading in congruent so this is what we are most of us thank you so you can see that uh, If the, the the dominance of the left cerebral hemisphere pushed us to read the word more than the color, so that was our first thing. okay now coming to the second activity visual short term memory okay so in this activity what are we supposed to do this is a visual short term memory vstm now visual short term memory actually tells you uh, or highlights the ability to retain a small amount of visual information letters shapes colors etc just over a short period of time for example if you are uh, sitting in a bus or in a train or on the passenger seat of a car or probably you are riding at the back of the bike and somebody else is driving at what time you do say you are not driving it you are sitting so when you are sitting idle you are mostly peeking around looking at your surroundings people crossing and you are the cars that you are passing by and the billboards that you are coming across or probably some faces that you just uh, uh, stop to look and then you move on and probably some kind of uh, some some stray animals or birds there so a lot of information visual information goes to your brain every time you are you just pop up in your eyes especially when you are when you are uh, outdoors even in indoors even in indoors it's the same thing but yes outdoors there is a lot of new information coming in your in your brain your brain cannot keep all that information just some chunks of the information will be kept and soon they will be replaced by even more chunks so these chunks of information are what we are we are more interested in 
this is called as the stm so your uh, the, the part of your short term memory it it stores the visual information and it keeps you uh, it keeps it keeps you keep on, on the track so that you can keep on performing the cognitive task that you are supposed to do for example which part of the brain is involved your posterior parietal cortex which is which is mostly correlated with the visual uh, short term memory all the items that you store in the visual short term memory they are stored for a short period of time and when they are uh, when they are stored for the short period of time uh, it is it is suggested that uh, uh, you can store a maximum of nine chunks of information nine chunks of information now what do you mean by nine chunks of information we'll just uh, uh, we'll try to work out this uh, activity and i won't you i won't allow, i won't ask you to use the chat window now because if you use the chat window so that would uh, actually be an aid for somebody else so what i'll give you i'll give you a list of a list of words for example i'll speak out a word and i'll ask you to recall without turning your mic on i want you to recall what i said then i'll give you another term second word and then i'll ask you to recall both words together then i'll give you a third word and i'll ask you to recall the first and the second and the third word then i'll ask you to i'll give you a fourth word. i'll try to i'll ask you to recall the first the second the third and the fourth and then i'll give you the fifth word and then the sixth and then the seventh i hope you get uh, you try you actually are getting what i'm trying to say in this since we are not using the chat window i can't uh, i can't ask you to uh, uh, to to share it on the chat window because if you speak that word out um, it will be an aid for an other person so you have to be you have to be you have to keep it as unbiased as you can and uh, you have to keep things as to yourself a score of for example above 9 i have a list of 11 words by 11 12 in fact so if you have if you can store more than 9 in your visual short term memory that means your visual short term memory capacity is like you are working at a very high capacity if your range is between 5 to 9 this is something very normal something normal that we do routinely we keep 5 to 9 chunks in our in our brain we can't keep more than 5 or 9 we more than 9 in fact if it's less than 5 then that's that means you are working on a low capacity so with that i'll just uh, push the word to you so the first word is duck d u c k duck try to memorize the word and just recall it to yourself what's the first word i said to you just recall it. and i think you have learned that by now that i what word i i won't use the word again the second word is karachi the city from which we are uh, hosting this karachi k a r a c h i this is the second word now to yourself i want you to recall both the word the first and the second word can you recall okay come to the third the third word is football f w t b a l l football try to learn this third word in the sequence so try to recall the three words now i am giving you the fourth word jupiter j u p i t e r jupiter can you recall all the four okay here comes the fifth word playground try to memorize the word playground and try to recall all the five words
The sixth word is dustbin. D U S T B I N. Dustbin. Try to store that in your memory. Now try to list down or recall all the six words that you have learned. Can you recall all six of them? Okay, then comes the seventh word, sweater. S-W-E-A-T-E-R, sweater. Can you recall all the seven words? Then kilogram. Then millennium. And lastly, brain. This is the list that I have asked you to learn. Since this is a visual short term memory test, I was just giving you auditory stimulus to begin with. Now I have displayed the list to you. Duck, Karachi, football, Jupiter, playground, dustbin, sweater, kilogram, millennium, and brain. I have displayed 10 words to you. Take, your, take about a minute or two. Learn the sequence. Learn these words. Okay, now these 10 words have been listed. How many of these 10 can you recall? And which capacity are you in? Share the result on the chat window if you want. If you are not comfortable, you can skip. No compulsion there. I just want to give you an idea how this visual short term memory test is used. Very good. All 10, which means that you are very well focused in this lab tutorial. <laughs> good to know. Good to know. Uh, that's so positive. That's so positive. I, I would be flat at six. I know. Good. Salman, I think we are on, on the same boat. Good. 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 
वेरी गुड नाउ इट्स टाइम so the, the chunk of information that we can keep in our visual short term every this these these informations they they push us to keep on working uh, in 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 our in our uh, life so we we just use these for processing and uh, that's how we just keep on working so even if you are if you are of as the, the example that i gave to you initially when we when i started visual short term memory for example when you are going uh, and you are sitting uh, by the side in a in a car or on a bike or on in a, in a train or on any vehicle and you are uh, you are moving along the road and you are looking out of the out the window or just by the side so you see things going in going out coming in your view and then fading away how many of those information stay with you if you try to count them they will always be between 7 plus minus 2 chunks of information this is our this is the limit of our brain so if it's beyond that uh, uh, beyond a uh, 9 10 that means that's really good that's really good i have attempted this test i'm i'm always 6 six, 6 six, so i won't <laughs> go to do this again okay i think we can jump to our third activity the third activity is is uh, is uh, is again something interesting this is verbal fluency um When we are talking about verbal fluency, verbal fluency means how fluent you are in pronouncing certain verbs, and uh, this include two types of fluency. We we discuss uh, semantic verbal fluency (SVF) and phonic verbal fluency (PVF). They both engage different brain circuits. Both involve activation of the frontal region and the striatum. Uh, short term cognitive function test this is um, often often a part of clinical practice in neuro uh, physiology neuropsychological assessments uh, any kind of lesion in the left hemisphere it can predict the reductions in the verbal fluency in the verbal fluency task these measure the verbal ability to function any poor performance in these tasks detect clinical defects in cognition the word production of verbal fluency it is also linked to bdnf an invasive marker since we are not going to invasive markers but you can probably just link a non invasive uh, tool with an invasive marker if in your study protocols if you want to so these are the uh, this is the paradigm in which these tests are conducted and uh, if you are if you want to find out the verbal fluency for phonic uh, fluency this is sensitive to frontal lesions FAS test is performed or finger tapping test is performed. I won't go for finger tapping test, although this can be used as well. Uh, we would do FAS test and semantic verbal fluency, which is sensitive to temporal lesions, is uh, uh, is uh, counting how many words can be produced in one minute with one alphabet. So, uh, what we'll be doing, we'll not be do going for all these tests because of the. Uh, I want to keep this uh, bit. Because we want to do further things as well, so semantic verbal fluency is uh, okay. Let's do that. let's do that <laughs> semantic verbal fluency. So this uh, semantic verbal fluency, as I told you, this this involves uh, temporal lobe activation. So any lesion in the temporal lobe will not will 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 uh, will actually be affecting SVF. what do you have to do in this activity this is the this is activity 2a number of words produced with a single letter in 60 seconds in this test left inferior and the middle frontal cortex is putum and thalamus are are involved so what do you want to what you will do i want you to do i want you to i'll just mention a letter on the chat window and i want you to take that timer with you again uh, a stopwatch or or your mobile phone and in exact 60 seconds try to count how many words were you able to produce or uh, with that particular letter okay 
two, three, start. That's a very good result. Um, some some results are very good. And, uh, so that there, with this, these words actually uh, again uh, this this depends on your um, your uh, your vocabulary as well. So how frequent how avid a reader are you? For example, some people are very much into reading, so they normally perform very well in these tests of verbal fluency. So this is phonic verbal fluency in which we use a certain letter. So what brain parts were you in, were you engaging? You were engaging your left inferior and middle frontal cortices. You were involving your putum and you were involving your thalamus in this particular activity. Now, um, what are we to do? We will move on to activity two B, FAS test. This is for this test is for phonic verbal fluency. Now, when we are doing phonic verbal fluency, we uh, we perform FAS test. Now, what you are what you are to do in the FAS test? This is activity two B. It's a subtest for neurosensory center, and uh, in this you will have one minute each for three letters, F, A, and S. You will pronounce all the words. 
that you can recall for f for 60 seconds you will count how many you you were able to uh, utter out then you will turn off the timer then you will catch you will start the timer again for another 60 second you will see how many words can you pronounce for a and then you stop the timer after a 60 second then for the third you start the timer once again and for another 60 second you calculate the you count the number of words that you were able to uh, utter or produce for the letter s so this is called as fas test so for a come for a total of 3 minutes you pronounce words with f a and s respectively one for each 60 seconds and then you sum up all these words together how many were you able to produce so let's start with this so one two and three first with f then with a then with s 60 second each Very good. We, we get normally these results only. Somewhere between 35 and 60. Normally I've seen people producing these many words, a maximum of 60 or as, as above as uh, 35 or something.
very good. Yes, exactly, Fazia. This is what we are supposed to do. You will take the letter F first. And uh, uh, when you take the letter F for letter F, you will start the timer and you will start to produce as or pronounce or speak out as many words as you can for the letter F. And try to keep on counting how many words will you be able to produce. Plurals are not counted. If a plural and a singular word will be counted as one. So all the words with F are given 60 seconds. So all the words with F you can produce in 60 seconds. Then you shut the timer. You write down how many words were you able to produce for letter F. Then again, hold the timer and start it. And now you pronounce, you just produce a word, the words with the letter A. And then keep on going on for letter A and for, for those 60 seconds. Once the 60 second mark comes, stop it and count how many were you able to produce, write it somewhere. And then for the, uh, another 60 second, repeat it for the letter S. At the end, sum up all the words. For example, if you're able to produce 20 for F and five for A, and uh, for example, 10 for S. So your, your answer will be 20 plus five plus 10. So that would be 35. Okay, so I think if you are done, we can move on uh, because otherwise we won't be able to complete all the activities and uh, we have, I think, uh, next 35 minutes to end this. So uh, coming to another very interesting feature, moving on from neurological, a uh, pure, um, pure neurological stuff to something more of a motor. Uh, so rather than just, uh, just staying where we are, so we'll we'll go to a different uh, different modality here, and um, this is called as the hand grip strength. And uh, uh, the hand grip strength is measured. Uh, it's it's basically a measure of how much uh, maximum single effort can you produce. Obviously, we can't uh, we can't have this test done with you 
in a virtual session, in a virtual setting, but I'll try my best to elaborate the procedure to you so that you are uh, very well familiar with the with this uh, with this protocol and this is something very interesting and something very fascinating as well so hand grip strength we use uh, the hand dynamometer so as a person grows old our muscular strength it it derails it declines and because and the, the, the main reason for this is because more of most of the fat is the most of the muscle mass is converted to fat and obviously with fat you can't really uh, Pull all the strength or the maximum effort cannot be cannot be generated. Now, once the uh, grip strength is uh, is measured, uh, the strength of of your grip it basically predicts the mortality. Early life mortality is directly correlated with a weak grip strength, and there are papers and papers uh, uh, about this this uh, this finding. That if you have a weak grip strength, then you are more vulnerable to an early death as compared to uh, as compared to uh, a stronger grip strength. Okay, good enough, Homera and Fazia. I think we'll move on from FAS test now, and we'll move on to the next activity because it will take a lot of time. I hope you get you got the idea of what FAS test is about. I hope you got the idea of what phonic uh, verbal fluency and semantic verbal fluency, two types of uh, fluency, what they are testing. So coming back, a recent study that was published in just uh, just last year, it actually uh, okay okay these tubes are the, okay these are these are so these these comments must be I think uh, a bit delayed. So I, I I think it's fine it's fine then I'll I'll keep on moving on. Okay. So a very recent paper in 2020, it it uh, it showed something very significant that they said that the mortality decreases by four percent for every kilogram rise in hand grip strength. This is something very uh, say uh, something to hope for and something to cling on to that if you increase your hand grip strength, so uh, this actually um, can protect you from unnecessary early risk of death. So resistant type of exercises, aerobic exercises, they are the most effective ones to initiate muscle hypertrophy. So the more, for example, uh, chin-ups and pull-ups and the uh, uh, hand grip curlers that people use, um, they, can be, they can be used, barbells and dumbbells. So they, they actually increase your grip strength. So this is the hand dynamometer, which is used for this particular uh, modality. This hand dynamometer is a battery operated hand dynamometer. It can be set for a certain age and gender. It displays the maximum grip strength in two units, either kilogram and pounds. You can just change your unit either way. It categorizes the grip strength into three categories, either weak, normal, or strong. So the, the protocol is that you set the hand dynamometer according to the subject's age and gender. The subject is then asked to pull the grip holder of the hand dynamometer downward with the maximum strength with the dominant hand and the score is noted in kilograms and classified into weak, normal and strong according to the age as per male and female cutoffs. So what I'll do here, I'll just stop the sharing of this and I'll go and I'll play a recording, a video that we recorded in our lab for this particular hand grip strength.
Okay, I'm sharing my screen now uh, of the video and I'm sharing the sound of this video as well so that uh, you are able to hear it perfectly. We are demonstrating the... Hello participants, uh, here we are demonstrating the use of battery operated hand dynamometer for grip strength. This battery operated hand dynamometer comes in this box this model is e um, h101 this is operated by batteries this is this, all the details are mentioned here how this is to be used this hand dynamometer comes with a manual and if you are if you plan to use this hand dynamometer for measuring head grip strength you should go through the entire manual this manual shows to you how the hand dynamometer is to be calibrated, the, uh, the, the buttons which are to be pressed and for what feature each will state. So this, hand this is the hand dynamometer. It is having these buttons. This is for on. This is for selecting the particular criteria uh, increasing or decreasing. And then this is to start. So when you start this to, to test the grip strength, uh, we press this button. This handle is, is uh, provided as well. It comes with a lever here. So what the subject is to be uh, is to be doing in this kind in this uh, experiment is that the subject will be asked to hold the hand dynamometer with the dominant arm. So for example, if I am right-handed, this is my dominant arm. I'll hold the hand dynamometer and I'll then pull this particular lever as much as I can. So when I pull this with my maximum strength. A digital value will be recorded here of maximal grip strength irrespective of how many minimal values were there the maximum grip strength will be recorded here the numerical value will be displayed in two units you can use kilograms as well as pounds for that and this will this this uh, dynamometer will categorize it into three either of the three categories normal weak or strong this is the data or you can say the results uh, which this particular dynamometer comes with. This dynamometer tells you the values for both gender, male and female and the age category which they belong to and in which uh, values the hand grip strength should be to qualify either for weak, normal or strong grip strength. So what we'll do, we'll start with our experimental setup. I have already set this for the particular subject that I'm having here. The subject is male. So using the uh, these, these uh, buttons here, I have selected gender male. This is my user four here. This is the fourth subject I'll be me I'm measuring the grip strength of. The age of this particular subject is 34. So this, this dynamometer, if it's not in use for a few, uh, a few seconds, uh, it goes in, in an auto off mode to prevent unnecessary loss of battery life. So what I do, I'll provide this with uh, the hand dynamometer to my participant and I'll ask the participant to just pull on this lever with as much force as the participant can. So dear participant, welcome to the hand dynamometer use your dominant arm is right hand so what you have to do when i say start i'll press the button start here once i press the button start what you have to do you pull this lever towards your thumb with maximal force the value will be recorded you can apply as much force as you think you have and it will give you a numerical value for that so i'm pressing my button start here If you think you can pull further, do that. Otherwise, you can just let go. Let. Okay. So the value recorded here is twenty-four point five, and according to the age and gender of this subject, it falls in the category of weak. So in this, this hand dynamometer actually shows that most of the population. In today's times, they fall in the category of having a weak hand grip strength for reasons that should be uh, probably looked into in further studies and researches that why 
uh, individuals who otherwise are healthy and are living a healthy lifestyle are still having a grip strength which is either normal or weak and not strong. The study that we conducted in this lab, we had 412 participants and all the participants uh, used this hand grip, uh, this, this hand dynamometer to measure the hand grip strength and we, uh, we were actually just uh, quite uh, alarmed to find out that majority of participants of our study, they also were apparently healthy but they all fell in the category of either having a normal grip strength or a weak grip strength, otherwise they they actually were healthy and most of them were engaged in sports as well as in, in many athletic uh, performances as well but still their head grip strength was found to be weak. So that's it from my side. Thank you so much. So, uh, to, uh, participants, I think uh, this was the demonstration of how hand grip strength can be uh, can be measured using a simple battery operated hand dynamometer. And as I told you that uh, the grip strength is directly correlated with the with um, the chances of early life mortality. So, uh, it's it's worth exploring that why. Uh, people today or in today's times they have a weak grip strength for their age as compared to what they think that their grip strength is because many of us feel that our grip strength is very strong and it actually is normal but when we use a, 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 a device so we actually find out that it's not the scores of the grip strength they are given in the in the packing of this uh, whichever hand dynamometer you, you purchase for the study the grip strength uh, measures are mentioned or the cutoff values are given with the packaging of that hand dynamometer and the and the cutoffs are based on the gender as well as for age for females the values for weak strong and normal are different for males the weak strong and normal are different for the same age category. So for example, they will have the list of females from 20 to 24 and then from 24 to 28 and something like that. If we can't change the settings of the device, the device, uh, be it this hand dynamometer EH101, which we use or any other hand dynamometer, they are designed by the manufacturers in such a way that according to the cutoff values, they already have uh, the uh, these ranges fixed. So whatever uh, device you are using, it will already have the preset value with you. Very much, uh, very much similar to the the, the, the uh, biosensors that we use, for example, for measuring blood glucose. That you place a drop of blood glucose, it measures the amount of current that is generated, and the uh, software that put that that just just shows to you how what's the blood glucose concentration so the cutoff is already set up set within the within the apparatus so this is how the apparatus of uh, hand dynamometer is designed there are various hand dynamometers available in the market for this for, for this kind of study uh, the one we use was battery operated there are others which can be linked to a to a live uh, screen and you can actually see the plateau or you can see the amplitude of the strength as a graph on screen it depends on how sensitive apparatus you want to use for this apparatus or uh, for this kind of set activity five uh, this activity Actually, the hand dynamometers are based on the population on which you use. For example, EH101, this uh, battery operated hand dynamometer is for Asian population. This, this is designed uh, for Asian population and uh, the, uh, the Abbott Pharmaceuticals, they provide this to their diabetologists. Uh, 
um, so that the uh, for a, for a better prognosis of uh, of diabetic complications can be assessed. So the hand dynamometer is the EH EH one o one. This is based on Asian population. Obviously, if we try to apply the same one on African population or American or European population, not American, the European population, it does the the results will be very different. Would be quite varied. Okay, so uh, another activity uh, we can't we won't be performing this activity. I'll just uh, review this activity. This is the physical performance test. and this physical performance test uh, actually highlights how highlights the muscle frailty muscle frailty that can uh, for example the one that we just discussed was grip strength but it's not just the grip strength that's going frail very various other parts of the of your of bodily features of muscular coordination will go weak as well so this scale was initially point uh, was highlighted was was there yeah, was uh, say produced in 2000 and later modified in 2005 there are nine items in this um the first item means the person is asked to stand with a static balance with the feet together and uh, keep standing there for 10 seconds semi tandem is when uh, the the person is uh, stand with one heel of one foot placed on to the side of the first toe uh, and to the opposite foot of for 10 seconds the subject chooses which foot can go forward then there is a tandem In which the stand is the first, which the subject will stand with the heel of one foot directly in front of the other foot. So these are the three ways in which the subject is asked to stand for static balance for ten seconds each. The second activity is chair rise. Use a straight back chair, and the person is a uh, part participant sits with the arms folded across the chest, and then stands up and sit down as quickly as possible five times. Keeping arms folded, you stop timing when the participant stands the fifth time, and the total time is calculated. Book lift, you place a five point five pound book or a heavy book on the table in front of the subject, and you ask the subject to raise the book as quickly above the shoulder level. By the time you say go, then put on and removing a jacket. Uh, the cardigan is worn, and then the person is asked to just uh, uh, unbutton it and take it off completely. Pick up a penny on the floor. The person, uh, after an approximately twelve inches of uh, it, it, it's uh, penny is placed twelve inches from the patient's foot on the dominant side, and the person is asked to pick that up. Turn three sixty degrees around, fifty foot walk test, and then there's a stairs test. The scoring is based on uh, these cutoffs. If the score is between thirty-two to thirty-six, this means not frail. If it's between twenty-five to thirty-one, mild frailty. If it's between seventeen to twenty-four, moderate frailty. And less than seventeen, it means the person is unable to function in community independent. So this is the questionnaire. This is the questionnaire that the that we ask the the subject to fill. In fact, we fill it ourselves while the subject performs. First task is standing with static balance, feet together, semi tandem and tandem. We calculate the timing for each, and we we mark the score four, three, two, one, or zero. Then chair rise again. The time taken, whatever the time is taken, the scores are calculated for that. Lifting a book and putting it on the shelf once again, the time is noted and the score is tabulated. Put on and remove a jacket. Again, uh, the time is noted in seconds and the score is tabulated. Pick up a penny from the floor. Once again, the time is noted and the score is tabulated. Turning 360 degrees. Now, in this 360 degree turn, we categorize the subject on the basis of discontinuous steps and continuous steps. If they were continuous steps, we give direct a score of two. If the if the steps were discontinuous, then zero. Then again, steady or unsteady? Was it was the turning steady or unsteady? Again, we'll give zero or two a point. Fifty foot walk test: the person walks uh, fifty foot straight. Again, we uh, uh, we note down the time for that. Climbing one flight of stairs: the time taken for that is cal is noted and then scored is score is just added. Climbing the stairs: number of flight of stairs up and down maximum four. So. The total the, the nine items are then calculated. The sum is calculated, and we see whether where, where the where the 
score total score line. So this is the scoring. Normal people should score between 32 to 36. This is not fair. If you are scoring between 25 to 36, that means they are 20, that means 25 to 31, sorry. That means that there is mild failure. So this test can be together, can be added together to the grip strength test to address the issue that uh, you were uh, pointing, um, the population bias. Coming to the last test, olfactory performance. This is the last activity. Uh, again, the activity cannot be performed. So what I'll, I have, I have recorded a video with one of my participants to highlight to you how olfactory performance test is conducted. We humans, we have 300 of active olfactory receptor genes. That's a huge number of genes for that particular processing. And we have a sensory organs in the olfactory epithelium and the bulb and then the brain. Um, we have a region known as the primary and the secondary olfactory cortex that deal with olfaction. The cell body dendrites and exon of these segments, they have bipolar receptors located inside the olfactory neuroepithelium. There are two theories that surround uh, uh, the, uh, how uh, olfactory disrupt, disrupt, distortion can occur, a peripheral reason of losing functionality in the, in the neurons or a central reason. So if a person is having reduced olfactory performance, that means something is going wrong, either central or peripheral. So uh, dementia, sinusitis, mood swings, social seclusion, depression, they have been linked with olfactory disruptions, nasal obstructions, head trauma, medications, any CNS uh, abnormality, uh, they also affect your uh, olfactory epithelium. So I'll just skip these, uh, uh, this reading material for now. How the test is performed? This is how the test is performed. This is, this is a picture showing to you how one of our participants was performing this test and this is the test being performed. Once again, what I'll do, I'll go to the recorded video and I'll show to you how this test is performed. Okay, so I have shared the screen and the video. This is how the olfactory test is performed. Okay, uh, hello uh, participants. Uh, here we are demonstrating how smell identification test is conducted. Uh, this is a kit purchased from Germany. This is called sniffing sticks. These sniffing stick kit is having 12 fell pens. These are the 12 fell pens here. Each pen is marked with a certain number. For example, the pen that I'm holding right now, this is labeled with uh, number three. And for example, this is this is number 10. So we have a total of 12 uh, felt pens here. Each pen is having a different fragrance or a different smell. How this test is to be conducted? The participant who is sitting next to me, I'll present one pen at a time to the participant. The participant will be asked to inhale using both nostrils. Once the participant has inhaled, I'll put the cap back on this felt pen and I'll place the felt pen box where it is. Next, what the participant will be asked, the participant will be given this type of a card. This card is for pen one. You can see this mentioned pen one. So this card is for pen one. The participant will then be asked to identify which of these four fragrances or the smell was there in the pen that was labeled as one. So if the participant says that this was C, so what the participant would do, this is the answering sheet or the recording sheet here. The participant would just mention that particular A, B or C, whichever option the participant feels for question one. So this is, uh, this, this is the pen one. So we have 12 pens and each one, the answer for, answer for each one of these will be recorded as A, B, C, D according to the performance of these uh, participants. Once this is done and completed, we'll calculate the total sum of correct answers. And with those correct answers, we'll actually just find out that our participant was in either of the category of normosomia, hyposomia, or ensomia. So I think we can start.
have you spelled it? Okay. Can you identify which one of this was that? In this in this table, because it's for both nostrils. Pen two. This is pen two. I'm presenting pen two to the participant now. The participant can take as long as the participant wants to inhale, and the participant can even ask the pen to be inhaled more than once. Again, four options are there for pen two. So once this card is done, I'll place it apart so that the cards don't mix up. This is pen three. Can you identify which one of this smell was there in pen three? I'm presenting pen four to her now. Identify and mark it on the answering key that's given to you. This is pen six. Can just someone pass the box to me? Thank you so much. This is the this is the pack in which this uh, sniffing sticks come. I'll just let you know why I asked for this box. Okay, this is pen eight. the second last pen This is the answering key. So what we'll do now, since we filled our uh, our table for both nostrils, the test can be conducted for further for right nostril or left nostril, keeping one closed at a time, or for both nostrils. Since I've used both nostrils option at, uh, right now, my participant was inhaling all these pens from both nostrils. So what I'll do, we'll use this key and we'll place it here and we'll see what the participant scored. Okay. Now this is can you come? Mm -hmm. 
10. So your score is 10. So 10 of 12. You were able to identify uh, two, uh, 10 pens uh, correctly and two of them were not correct here. So according to the normogram which is provided to us by the uh, manufacturer of this particular brand of sniffing sticks, they tell us that the, uh, the participant can be then told about the performance. How so? This card at the back shows a normogram. The normogram for both genders, male and female respectively, the, uh, the genders are mentioned here. Uh, the total number of pens are 12. So if they were able to identify less than 6, so that means that the individual is, is ensomia. If they were able to identify between 10 and 6, so this was uh, hyposomia. And if it was between 12 and 10, so this is uh, actually uh, normosomia. The condition in this pens, uh, in this test, is that this test actually is used um, in identifying smell, its smelling ability or the ability to smell. According to the researches and the studies that have that we have followed, or according to those the manufacturers of these uh, felt pens, it is told that majority of people uh, think that they have normal smelling ability, where actually they don't their smelling ability is a bit reduced and that actually shows some kind of degeneration which has occurred somewhere in the olfactory pathway. Another important feature regarding these pens is that for example if this is pen 10 and there are four options and the, the, the subject is unable to identify which smell this is. So when I present the card 10 to the subject and the subject is not uh, it, it, the subject doesn't know how a pear smells or how the prune smells or peach or, or, or for example pineapple so the subject is still asked to make a forced choice the forced choice will give a statistic random value and which does which doesn't include any kind of bias so even if a subject is if a subject says that i don't really know which smell is this still the subject will have to point out any one of the four options uh, and that's the statistical way of doing of performing this test so thank you participant for your participation in the test i hope you <laughs> enjoyed it that's my question uh, what, what is the Okay, so participants, this was uh, this was the smell identification test and the last activity that we were supposed to do for the non-invasive testing. So um, I think uh, that's it from my side. We discussed these different modalities, different tests that can be performed for screening your own population or any kind, any uh, subject or group of subjects that you want to screen for. A certain neurological decline or any underlying medical cause for apparently healthy individuals because uh, for especially for smell and identification tests and the grip strength test we have seen that people underestimate their performance many people who think that they are very strong and they actually are strong you can see that they are doing gym regularly they are doing all the physical activities very regularly and they are quite fit but still uh, they end up performing poor in this test. And same goes for olfactory performance tests as well. So the content is covered. If you have any questions, uh, would like to answer this. Uh, Fazan, if you can uh, if you can answer some of the questions, uh, I'm narrating it to you sure. so that you can answer. First is about the scores of grip strength. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, uh, one of the uh, candidate I asked Ahmed is asking that weak, normal or strong or it can be high values uh, so how it is uh, set uh, in the device uh, which population is used to set these values Miss, I, uh, I answered the uh, answered these questions okay. when okay. he raised sure, sure, sure. the yes, question yes, I remember, I remember I thought it is again okay 
uh, then uh, there is a, a question uh, on the YouTube by Fozia Batul. Physical performance can be done with 32 scoring as well. So her question is, can we apply it for the population of 50 plus uh, as it is basically for older population, as she said? Uh, Fozia, the test is basically for older individuals only. This is we are using just for the routine protocol. As I was mentioning this, uh, when we were, uh, when I was highlighting this test of physical performance frailty, uh, I discussed this point that most of us will still, we will be, we'll be scoring as not frail. But in our study, we found out that individuals who had a weak grip strength and who were not in the age of above 50, they were still showing mild frailty. So this scale, although applicable for older individuals can be used just for the screening purpose, not for something absolute. Obviously, this cannot be used for something absolute. Okay, uh, Fezan, I think this is the similar question, but it is via Google form that uh, when we want to do study related to age uh, or related to geriatric um, subjects, so it is, uh, is it specific to set 60 plus or 65 uh, as the age or we can do it after 50s as well? Uh, I didn't get the question. Uh, basically, they want to ask that for uh, the aging population or geriatric population, uh, is it necessary to put the bar of the age uh, 60 plus or we can do it on the 50 plus as well? Uh, when you are, when a certain study is being conducted on aging and your and the, and the age brackets that you are designing, if you are going for general aging, then you will you can include various age brackets. You can, you can include individuals uh, below 50 and above 50 and above 60 as well. But if you are going for a certain age group, then you have to follow the international guidelines of categorizing the individuals into the three categories of young age or middle age and older age, according to the international guidelines. They are to be used. Okay. Now, the... Uh... Joshua Wilson is asking about the short-term memory test. He's asking that, uh, sir, is there any difference between learning the sequence and memorizing the sequence? Are they distinct cognitive processes or synonymous? Uh, the sequence and the items are two distinct processes. The sequence in which you remember and the items that you try to remember are two distinct processes. If you are trying to connect the sequence with the items, you are learning two things and recalling two things at the same time. So two distinct pathways are working. But if you are just recalling the items irrespective of the sequence, that means you are performing uh, one part of the uh, one part of the uh, pathways of the brain is being used and not the other. Okay. Uh, Rojda Froze is asking what FAS test score depict and what is its purpose? The purpose, uh, Rojda, of FAS test is to see how well the person is able to recall the words that the person is already having stored in the memory. Not the new words. The person is already literate or the person has already heard these words or is aware of these words. And it is the awareness of these words and already they are in the memory the person is just being asked to recall those when the stimulus is provided. For example, if we ask the person to pronounce the words with the letter, with the letter F in the 60 second, the person knows that he or she is having just 60 seconds to recall the words. His or her memory may have a lot more words. But in those 60 seconds, how well the person was able to perform. So again, how well your body responds to a certain stimulus, how well your brain can coordinate these pathways and integrate the information in that stimulated time. Okay, uh, one question is by Dr. Deepak. Uh, he's asking that uh, from these tests, can we use any for the depression as well? Uh, or yes, can for we use these tests? For uh, the olfactory performance, uh, olfactory performance is found to decline in depression. So a person who, who, who is, who is uh, having clinical depression, uh, olfactory performance tests can be used in that individual. Apart from that, uh, that's the main test that one can focus because with depression, if olfactory performance is declining as well, that means that the person will not be able to respond to the 
any kind of uh, uh, the, the the smells in their in their in their social surroundings and when you cannot respond to a smell for example the fragrance uh, coming from a certain odor or of or, or the smell of the food if you do, if you're not very well responding to the smell of the food you will not feel like eating it if you're not responding well to the smells of the flowers you can't feel refreshed so these sense of smell are very important and yes they can be incorporated in um uh, in screening for depression um, one last question is that uh, it is a very initial question when you uh, were starting your presentation that you mentioned about biomarkers uh, which are now used to detect alzheimers so is there any research to prevent further progression of the disease or some uh, other uh, invasive test or something i think they are trying to ask that okay so uh, since i am not i have not taken this uh, this uh, this lab tutorial towards invasive markers or towards actual pathologies so i would refrain from uh, answering that because that would uh, that would be, go beyond my uh, my part of expertise a person who is more uh, in uh, who was more uh, you can say abreast in the information and knowledge about the pathological biomarkers which are invasive and how the degeneration of or the top proteins or the entanglement of the brain or the enlargement of the ventricles they can be prevented so uh, i think a person who is a medic in that in that case would be a more better a more suited person to answer that way i would prof i would probably not take that question Thank you, Fazan. Can you unshare your screen? Sure, sure. Thank you so much. I I had a very good time with all the participants and uh, all the so participants. Much, thank you so much, Fazan. For and we will be we will be sharing the feedback with you as well. Uh, Certainly. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, interesting and very uh, fruitful lab session. Uh, I hope everyone have uh, learned something from this. Uh, we will be looking forward for your feedback, all the participants. Uh, you will get email or I think you have already an email in your inbox uh, by Ms. Ujala Sajid about the daily attendance and the feedback form. So kindly fill it up and uh, we will be back tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. Pakistan. Uh, with your respective time zone, you can join us. Tomorrow, we will be starting from Professor Dr. Khalid Iqbal from New York State University. And he will be actually uh, uh, giving a video talk. So he, he has already sent his talk. Uh, we will be meeting tomorrow. I uh, hope that uh, you have all the queries uh, answered. If you have further queries, you can email us. Yes, uh, I ask you have to fill the form daily because uh, it is kind of your attendance. So we are counting on the 80% attendance. So uh, maybe out of six days, uh, you must attend five days at least. But I recommend you all that uh, do attend all the six days because our speakers are putting an effort to just discuss uh, their research with you guys. So we are very hopeful. And uh, if any one of you uh, still have to present, uh, send their abstract or uh, e-poster and they haven't sent it yet, please do so. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.